Greetings, this is General CJG here, coming to you with the next part in our Defending the Prequels podcast series. We already did The Phantom Menace, now it's on for the second prequel movie, Attack of the Clones. And joining me here are several members, introduce yourselves. Greetings, this is Captain Henson, as always, happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Then we go to Dolan. And this is the Spider Fan Maniac. Mm hmm. Next, King Nasru. I bid you welcome, mortals. It's the Shadow King, King Nasru. Here to do another one of these prequel defense videos. Mm hmm. And finally, remember that we had in a previous State of Star Wars podcast, but now he's joining us to defend the prequels. Introduce yourself. Hey everyone, this is uh, Django Fett and uh, defending one of my favorite of the prequel movies out there and uh, yeah, I had to be a part of this one. Awesome. So without further ado, we shall begin with our experiences with the Attack of the Clones. Like the first time we saw it or hype leading into it and then seeing it. Our first experiences. So who goes first? I suppose I'll go first. Okay. As I remember, as far as back... With Attack of the Clones, I was 12 years old, and my uh, friends back in, I believe I was in I was still in elementary school, or maybe that was before it turned into a middle school. But aside from that, we were what well, we were talking about Attack of the Clones and trying to reenact some of the scenes we saw in the trailer. And then when we finally saw the movie, we all pretty much enjoyed it, and we just continued to reenact scenes that were there. As far as I could tell, nobody had complaints. Not even some of the adults that I asked. They said they enjoyed it, so prequel haters can't use the excuse that only kids like these movies. Hmm. And that's just, just some sort of nostalgia bias. Okay, anything else? No, that's pretty much it. Okay, well, who goes next? Uh, I'll go next. Okay. Now, Attack of the Clones, if I remember correctly, is one of the first times I ever used a DVD to watch a movie. Because prior to that, most of the times I used VHS, we used to go to the video store and let the videotapes. So, in that aspect, it was a kind of revolutionary aspect, even other than the movie itself. Now, when I was young, I didn't even know what the politics were, or the romance were. It was still interesting and fun, because... Lightsabers, lasers, and watching aliens. Those things are mostly cool. So yeah, I think I enjoyed it. Yeah, that's what I could say. Okay. So, who goes next? I'll go. So, very much like with Phantom Menace, the film was just always there. For, for as long as I can remember, even though, you know, it did come out two, like, uh, one and a half to two years after I was born. But... Yeah, in terms of actually remembering, it was just always there. And like with The Phantom Menace, I watched it, had no issue understanding what was going on, and was able to enjoy it. So, just goes to show you, kids can understand these movies. Cough, cough. Okay. Any other things to say? Well, just that... Uh, uh, my dad, who was a kid when the original trilogy came out, his only real issue with this one is that is the romance. So also just goes to show you, like what King said, there are adults who also enjoyed the films when they came out. Okay, so there's that. The jungle want to go first or I go? I can go. Okay. All right, so I was like with Nazaru and ended up seeing this in theaters and i think at the time i actually liked episode one more when i was watched that in theaters as well and it was just great seeing having been in that era where i wish i was born during the time of the original trilogy and watched those in theaters and then watched the prequels but i watched the prequels anyway and it was just great to see that in the theater experience and i remember seeing episode one twice and then episode two once but for some reason i enjoyed episode one at the time a little bit more but afterwards, I remember, you know, people watching the movie and throughout the movie, you know, especially when the Yoda fight happened, people were cheering and having fun throughout this film. They weren't like cringing or hating what was going on, maybe the romance at times. But overall, I think everyone had a good time and I didn't hear any complaints whatsoever. People had a great time with the movie. 
So I don't know where all this criticism came from, I guess, later on. But um, I guess when the theater experience came out, they just everyone enjoyed the movie, including myself. Okay. Anything else to say? No. Okay. Now my experience. Mine, similar to The Phantom Menace, I first watched the movie in DVD. Now, after I watched Phantom Menace DVD, my dad, a few, uh, one year later, because the Phantom Menace DVD came out in 2001, he got me Attack of the Clones and I saw it on DVD and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot because it was like the more recent Star Wars movie. I guess I was, it was the one that I was seeing the most, though there were times that I alternated back and forth between episode one and episode two. So there it is. So, but honestly, episode two, yeah, I was obsessed with it at uh, the time that I saw it on DVD and well, that's pretty much it. Uh, and there's not much in terms of my experience with the first two prequels, episode three, the one that is the most interesting in regards to my first experience. Uh, but I'm going to save that for the next video. So with that out of the way, uh, now we've got our first experiences out. Let's go with the impact on the fandom, the impact that this movie did to the Star Wars fandom. So I guess the first thing we should mention is that the hype for Attack of the Clones was not as big as The Phantom Menace. Is that true or false, uh, King of the Django? That was true. Yep, definitely. Yeah. I was too young to have noticed the, those, the relevance of the hype. So, like I said, I was a little, I was a little kid, so we were relatively easily impressed. So maybe I'm not the best person to ask that question. Mm. Yeah, I, I can go a little bit more because um, back when episode one came out, I mean, of, of course, it's been like, uh, you know, after episode six until episode one, I don't even know, remember how far uh, it was like 20, 30 years, maybe 16, I'm, 16 years. And it, with the box office numbers and people just obsessing over it and after the theater experience, people like universally loved that movie at the time. But yeah, after episode one, yeah, the hype wasn't there for Attack of the Clones. But it, it doesn't mean that people weren't excited for episode two at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hype was there, just not as big as Phantom Menace. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of similar to say uh, there was less hype for the Rise of Skywalker compared to The Last Jedi. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, yeah. at, at the end of the day, it's freaking Star Wars. There is going to be hype. To say there is no hype because you don't like those movies or let's say the movies are poorly made, it's just being ignorant. I mean, I don't think there was as much hype for the, for the sequels. Even After The Force Awakens, that is. Yeah, even with, For even with Force Awakens. Granted, that was the only one I saw in theaters. And this might be a little bit more anecdotal, but... When my father and I went to go see that movie, unlike with the prequels, we didn't have to wait like an hour in advance in line to get our seats. Uh, we just came in around the close enough to that time, like 10, 15 minutes, and we were able to get our seats easy like, as if we were watching any other film. Now, the hype wasn't really the same for us Koreans because Koreans in general, Star Wars isn't one of their favorite things. We like to focus more on stuff like Japanese animation or even our own. I think the same was with the with China too. I don't think they're a big fan of uh, China. Star Wars China's Wars. not. China even Japan. China was never a big fan of Star Wars. Yeah. So there's that. In regards to the hype, some now apparently some people claim that because the Phantom Menace was so badly received at the time that it came out, that the audiences were hoping that Attack of the Clones would be a big improvement over the Phantom Menace. Was that true? Were people actually hoping Attack of the Clones would be a massive improvement over the Phantom Menace? If you were to ask me personally, I don't think that was the case because when I asked everyone what they thought of the Phantom Menace, they, they were still in the, they said they still liked it. So I think anyone who said that they didn't like the Phantom Menace day one were like in the minority and very anecdotal. Hmm. I don't think the uh, prequel hate was around that time until like around 2008, Nine. 2009. Yeah. I mean, that's when it started to get traction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, there is one thing that some people claim that apparently back in the day, Hayden Christensen was bullied to no end, similar to Jake Lloyd, except that unlike Jake Lloyd, Hayden Christensen definitely didn't go, you know, didn't get his life ruined or something. Uh, but I, he was still bullied. I, yeah, uh, I, didn't, because I didn't know Hayden Christensen got bullied. Hayden Christensen was bullied, but not because 
what the OT fanboys wanted from Hayden Christian was the badass young Jedi, which is obviously something George Lucas was not intended to. <laughs> While people wanted to see a young Darth Vader, what George Lucas wanted from Hayden Christian was a young, emotionally and mentally kind of unstable young man who was trying to, you know, make his way in the universe. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into the detail of Anakin's character uh, a bit later. So, but let's just say that regardless of how Anakin Skywalker was portrayed in the movie, Hayden Christensen did not deserve to get this hate. He's just an actor. Like, he's just there to play a role. He shouldn't really... And then the same for uh, Jar Jar Binks, um, Emmett Best. I mean, yeah. he almost, he was about to, like, kill himself at one point because of all the bullying and stuff. This is what the fandom, like, Plinkett and Fuse Matthew and all these other people, they... This is what causes from this, you know, the effects from this, like the hatred and vitriol from this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. People just go crazy over this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep, indeed. And even to this day, they're still criticizing the prequels, obviously. <laughs> so Yeah, but there. I might discuss things more further, but I really like the specific scene where Jar Jar was looking at the camera like, Hey guys, guess what, bitches? I'm still here. I mean, I really like that because George Lucas was like, Oh, you didn't like Jar Jar? Guess what? He's still gonna be there. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, he kind of toned it down so it's like George Lucas was giving them the middle finger like Ryan Johnson. Oh, well, yeah. So there is that. Anyway, so I guess now we go to the plot summary of the movie. I mean, it's simple, just... Well, put it simply, 10 years after the invasion of Naboo, Galactic Republics facing a separatist movement, former queen, now Senator, Senator Pam Amidala, travels to Coruscant to vote on a project to create an army to protect the Republic. Upon arrival, she some, almost gets killed. And so there, therefore, uh, two Jedi, Obi-Wan and Anakin, are assigned to protect her. They, capt they capture the assassin, but the assassin was killed. So the Jedi Council assigned Obi-Wan to the investigation to find the to find the other killer. Well, Anakin protects Padme in Naboo. And from there, well, you know how the plot goes. Obi-Wan finds the killer, tracks him to Genosis. Well, Anakin saves Padme on Naboo and they fall in love. Then they get then they go to Tatooine to rescue his mother. You know the story. So I'm not gonna get into details of the story because that's not the main focus of this video. <laughs> so Suffice to say, that's the story of, Ta of Attack of the Clones. It's the beginning of the Clone Wars. <laughs> and, of and also Anakin's path to, well, one of the beginnings for his path to the dark side. So that's what the plot summary is. So with that out of the way, let's get into the characters. Starting with, obviously, the main one, Anakin Skywalker himself. So, Anakin Skywalker, what do you guys got to say about him? Okay, so the first thing I want to mention to the people watching the prequels is you are not supposed to expect a young Darth Vader from mm. Anakin Skywalker. You're supposed to expect a man who's trying to do good and wants to help people but faces reality because there's constant obstructions in this world which he eventually becomes corrupted because he knows no matter what and how hard he tries, he's eventually gonna fail. Yeah, a thing about Anakin when you don't watch the film is that you notice he's kind of naive and childish. In a way, he's, I mean, his ideals are kind of like Yagami from Death Note, which I watched recently, but not as sociopathic as it. What Els and Padme said about their respective counterparts is that they have a very childish view on their senses of, like, right and wrong. They don't see the nuances in them. And they think that things can be handled with simple solutions with Anakin being somewhat affecting of dictatorship to a degree. And Light Yagami using the Death Note to kill criminals and anyone who would obstruct him from carrying out his view of justice. So yeah, I mean, they you can really see that they did have some issues. Mm. Speaking of, there is one major thing we gotta address regarding Anakin Skywalker, uh, and it's one of the biggest criticisms saying at the movie that what we see is Anakin being nothing but a whiny teenage brat that always complains about anything and everything in the movie. Oh, so I gotta read. If I'm separated from a, from my mother for ten freaking years, 
with a bunch of monks that always forces me to control your emotion, be with peace. I'm gonna be whiny as hell. I mean, what do you expect? To be honest, I've he wasn't as uh, as whiny as I remembered or when was been told. I mean, I was like expecting petulance like a lot more, but he was as far. I mean, yeah, he does whine, but not as much as I thought he would. It was pretty subdued. I've heard, I've seen characters whine a lot more than Anakin Skywalker, so hmm. this was actually kind of refreshing. Hmm. I mean, Kylo Ren is an example. Oh, we'll get into him. Here's the thing with Anakin. So, he, of course, had a different kind of training than other Padawans, given how old he was when he joined the Order. So, you all, so right off the bat, you already have dissonance between, you know, him and other Jedi. Not to mention, and keep this in mind, and of course... This may come down to people just not liking the idea in general, but what was established in Episode 1 was that Obi-Wan didn't like Anakin. And the only reason, the only reason he took him on as an apprentice was because those were the last words of Mm Qui-Gon. So, right off the bat, we don't have a great relationship between the two. Now, of course, that developed over the course of a decade, but the fact remains, their relationship doesn't have a great foundation. So, of course, Anakin, along with stuff I already mentioned, is going to speak his mind and isn't going to be as emotionally stable as other Jedi because, again, not a great foundation for a relationship and also being taken away from his mom to join a bunch of monks at the age of nine. Yeah, so... There is a, oh, and not not to mention the Jedi also forbidding him from going to see his mother by himself. So that too. Yeah, there's also the fact that the Jedi do not understand how to actually, you know, help him. And that gets further shown in the next movie, but we really see it here. Case in point, Obi-Wan knows that Anakin is having dreams of his mother. And the best advice he can give him is, oh, they'll pass. <laughs> Even though he, it's clearly shown that Obi-Wan knows that Anakin isn't sleeping. Completely oblivious. Now, within the context of the movie and the world, it makes sense. Point is, it's very, very clear why Anakin acts the way he does. It makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The one thing you can notice while watching this movie and explaining the Phantom Menace is, this is one of the reasons why older Jedi should not be trained by when they reach a certain age because now Anakin is really different from other Jedi other than being the chosen one. He remembers the relationship he had with his mother. He knows a world outside of the Jedi Temple. So who knows what Anakin during the past 10 years would have thought. Constantly missing his mother, wondering how she's going to be treated under dwaddle, slavery. These things do wonders to a kid, believe me. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but of course, prequel haters don't really care much about that because they even go as far as saying that Kylo Ren in the sequels is what Anakin Skywalker should have been in the prequels. <laughs> that just seemed remember... like Sean a kiss before that blew up in his face. <laughs> I think the single most ironic thing I ever read in a Star Wars book, now I'm not using this to defend it, is one of the lines from Alpine Flight where George Sabio says something like, Pad one Skywalker is proof that older children are trainable. You can't be any more ironic than that. Seriously. I mean, look, Skywalker was very old and he still was trained. So there's that, there's him too as an example. So there's that. But yeah, I find it ironic that people say that Kylo Ren in the sequels when Anakin should have been in the prequels, despite Kylo Ren being far more whinier than Anakin ever was and not even having a good reason for being such a whiny brat. I mean- Seriously, we don't even know what Kylo Ren grew up as a kid. Oh, unless you're you're gonna force people to read books. By that point, why not ri- write that stuff in the movie? <laughs> and even then, it still doesn't make any sense. And also, Kylo Ren's like, what, 30-something years old, whereas Anakin is 19 in this movie? So, do you think that by 30-something years old, and being the second leader of the First Order, you think Kylo Ren would be a lot more respectful, more humble, more reserved in his emotions? But no. <laughs> So yeah, there's that with Kylo Ren. 
another thing regarding Anakin's character that some multi fanboys like confused Matthew and belated media, what they wanted is to see an Anakin Skywalker that was a nice and respectable guy that is selfless and cares about others and not just himself, as every relatable hero protagonist should be, and that later fell to the dark side in a surprising way, turning him into the Darth Vader we know in the OT. So they didn't want him to be a whiny teenage brat to care for himself, they wanted him to be more of a... I don't know, I, I guess kind of like Luke Skywalker in a way? Uh, kind of? Yeah, like with belated media, he pretty much has like a what if scenario, like his own script. His idea is not to focus on Anakin, but instead to focus on Obi-Wan. But I mean, Anakin is the main reason for the Star Wars films in the first place. So if you take out Anakin, then what's the fucking point? <laughs> there is no point. <laughs> They're just stupid. <sighs> they... Yeah. Uh, but there you go. So what do you guys think about ulti fanboys either saying that Ky the Kylo Ren's where Anakin should have been or that Anakin should have been more like Luke Skywalker? What do you guys think of that? Here's the thing. In terms of the Kylo Ren thing, for Kylo Ren, we have barely any context as to why he acts like that. Not to mention, he never really portrayed in a good light. He doesn't really have a good moment. It's not a good comparison because, like, and people were making this argument with only TFA in mind. <laughs> so you have a trilogy which, like, explores it, and we know exactly why he acts like that compared to one movie which does nothing to explain it. And in terms of Anakin acting more like Luke, that's... Or how Obi-Wan supposedly described him in the original trilogy. What we get in the prequels does not contradict anything that Obi-Wan tells us. Not to mention, with what we get, it makes complete sense why he turns to the dark side from the moment we meet him in the first movie. And in this movie in particular, we see more of that. Yep. Indeed. But I guess these salty fanboys didn't get that. <laughs> There is one other thing to mention about Anakin Skywalker. It does involve Hayden Christensen. There apparently some people claim that Hayden Christensen was like a bad choice to play Anakin Skywalker. Uh, just like Jade Lloyd was a bad choice for Anakin Skywalker. And that apparently George Lucas considered Hayden Christensen day one to be Anakin that didn't give uh, like auditions or, or had other options in mind. Like that's what they claim. And there is a show in Canada, I think, called the high ground. Yeah, I'm not joking. That's that's a drama uh -huh. where Hayden Christian appears as a main character. Okay. Yeah, what a coincidence. High ground and Hayden Christian at the same time. Now, the point is this drama actually deals with Hayden Christian's character being emotionally scarred due to some certain incident, which is also reflected on Attack the Clones. Mm-hmm. Which I think is really evidence enough to show that Hayden Christian could portray a man who has serious emotional problems and has conflicting ideas in the world. But they don't care. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Also, contrary to popular belief that, again, apparently the claim that George Lucas wanted Hayden Christensen and Anakin no matter what. Just like with Jake Lloyd in The Phantom Menace, Hayden Christensen also auditioned for Anakin Skywalker. There were multiple people in line, not just Hayden Christensen. Hell, there were even people like Leonardo DiCaprio, Paul Walker, Ryan Phillippe, etc. considered for the role of Anakin. So it wasn't just Hayden Christensen right off the bat, as some like stuckman claim. <laughs> I mean, you could argue that these other choices could have been better, but yeah, there was multiple people auditioning. Mm -hmm. So there is that for those that criticize Anakin Skywalker and Attack of the Clones because of the casting choice. So there's that. Anything else to mention on Anakin Skywalker's character? Oh. Wait, wait, General, I just did think of something uh, about Anakin Skywalker. Okay. Now, when we go back to watching the film and mentioning when uh, Yoda, Obi-Wan, and Mace Windu were talking about Anakin and how arrogant he was being and how he needs to get over that because he's the chosen one. Uh -huh. An interesting thing that Yoda says is that arrogance is 
a fault of many Jedi, even in the older ones. And what I like about the Attack of the Clones film is that it actually pays off on that. We actually do see that not just the young people like Anakin or Anakin, but also the elder ones like the uh, librarian Jedi was arrogant because she believed that the Jedi archive was absolute. There was no missing information in there. If it, if something wasn't in their archive, it just didn't exist. And then the kids, the younglings, pretty much told Obi-Wan that if the uh, files, I mean, if the data was missing, but the uh, everything else was supporting the, the existence of that planet, it just means that it was erased. Mm-hmm. It just really just shows how there were simple, simple answers that a child could figure out. Which really just shows how George Lucas actually respects children and realizes they're not stupid, which is a huge contrast to how Disney treats their audience these days with their films, where they treat them like idiots. <laughs> There's that indeed. Mm-hmm. So, okay, well, now we go to Obi-Wan. So, right off the bat, I'm going to say about Obi-Wan, we have got a lot more screen time for Obi-Wan Kenobi this time compared to The Phantom Menace. Now he plays a bigger role than before. And I definitely think I like it because I definitely one thing I did want it from Phantom Menace, but I understood why uh, there wasn't much of it. Uh, more Obi Wan Kenobi. I understood why because uh, he had because he had a specific role for that movie. Uh, but I definitely did want to see a bit more Obi Wan, and I got it here, and it was awesome. So that's what I gotta say. And he definitely now is a Jedi Knight. Definitely more in the mentoring role uh, as the master instead of the Padawan compared to the previous movie. Which also was kind of cool to see. So that's what I gotta say on Obi-Wan. Guys got something else to say on him? So Obi-Wan for example. Now Obi-Wan may be a mentor and a teacher. But he is not a definitely not a good friend. Okay, he's a good friend but... I'm not saying a good friend that actually understand Anakin in a more of a emotional level or more of a father figure because defeating a Sith doesn't mean Obi Wan may be skilled in the Force, may know philosophy, may defeat a Sith, but he's not a good master at the end of the day because his lack of understanding of Anakin is the reason why Anakin becomes more closer to the likes of Padme and Palpatine. Mm-hmm. In fact, you could see even in this movie that Anakin, while he's being uh, trained by Obi-Wan, you could see that it's Palpatine that's actually giving him some sort of lessons and advice on how to become a Jedi, which is pretty interesting that he, that Palpatine is the, is the mentor that Anakin leans closer to than Obi-Wan. So. I mean, if Qui-Gon was still alive, the entire Star Wars universe might have turned different because Qui-Gon actually knows how people actually function outside of the Jedi's ways. I would say that also applies to Palpatine because I I don't want to get into Palpatine's childhood because that's reached into the expanded universe. But we can, but considering he's a politician, we I could know that he, for the most part, grew up with a relatively normal life and would know the dynamics between a father and a son. Would know how to handle Anakin, whose main attachment was to his mother. Mm, Yeah. Uh, well, I will admit that, I mean, it was nice to see Obi-Wan do some stuff like doing some detective work, which really shows that he is really resourceful. At the same time, he, when he gets into arguments with Anakin, I mean, I know he, he, he means well, but he's kind of a dick to Anakin at times. I mean, granted, Anakin's being stubborn and somewhat reckless, but Obi-Wan's not really helping the situation. But at the same time, he is more aware than Anakin is. Like how Anakin actually is more willing to believe in in people like Pat, Palpatine and Padme and say that, trying to say that not all politicians are bad, which, I mean, generally is true, but not for like the likes of Palpatine. And Obi-Wan's pretty much just telling him to try to be a bit more discerning, basically wake up and smell the coffee, Anakin. These are politicians. They usually are nice to people who are beneficial towards them, and they'll say whatever they need to to get what they want. Mm-hmm. The only politician where that's not the case is obviously Padme herself, but Palpatine definitely fits that bill. <laughs> so, there is that. Did Django got something to mention on Obi-Wan in this movie? Well, I- I'm sure you guys pointed out uh, Ev- Evan McGregor is kind of like the perfect portrayal of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Oh, yes, um, definitely. Episode 1 and Episode 2 continues that trend. Episode 3, 
Like, he is instantly one of the best parts, and I think there has been no complaint on how great Evan McGregor is as Obi-Wan Kenobi. I, I have not seen a single criticism. Everybody's universally uh, loved his acting mm -hmm. uh, as Obi-Wan. Most, I would say, yeah. Most most people, even even most prequel haters, agree that Ewan McGregor was a perfect casting choice. So as young Obi Wan, yeah. So there's that, indeed. Anything else to mention on Obi Wan? Maybe later when we discuss plot holes, mm -hmm. oh. plot holes or something. Okay. Well, in that case, now we go to Padme. So what are we gonna say about Padme in this movie? Other than she now she is a senator. <laughs> I, I I just wanted to say that she's pretty ambitious. <laughs> She has some agency. She's not willing to be passive and be complacent when her life is in danger, when she feels like there's being a wrong done. She's willing to take action to do what needs to be done. Like she was willing to go to Tatooine so Anakin could rescue his mom and make sure she was all right. And then also go to Geonosis to rescue Obi-Wan, despite the fact that the Jedi Council was telling her to remain on Tatooine and be secured by Anakin. Mm -hmm. The constant thing I can see about Padme is she's the character who has conflicting ideas. So she has her own desires and wishes. Now, if I to go too deeper in that, that's novelization territory. So I won't go too deeper. But she wants to act like a normal person. She wants to, you know, have a romance relationship with Anakin. But she knows how reality works. And she's trying, constantly trying to convince Anakin that we have our duties and we cannot be constantly pursued by our emotions. But, you know, at the end of the day, she basically gives up, <laughs> marries Anakin. <laughs> yeah, so close so. to her emotions. <laughs> there is that, yeah. Indeed. But she still tries to hide the marriage, so the idea is still continued in certain ways. Mm. Yeah, indeed. And Sun, uh, got anything to say on Padme in this movie? <laughs> Compared to the last one? Well, similar to what we saw in the last movie, she's a badass. And um, something that I noticed this recent viewing is during the arena sequence, you know, when her, Anakin, and Obi-Wan are paired off with one of the monsters, she's the only one who takes, like, severe damage. And that she's clawed in the back. And I, I think it's an interesting choice because Anakin and Obi-Wan, they get knocked around, but they don't get, like, clawed. So I think that's just meant to show that despite her being at somewhat of a disadvantage, even if she is, like, um... A, a regular human and not a Jedi? Yeah, even if she is, like, you know beaten down or got like a severe injury she'll keep on fighting hell she was the first one to do something when they were chained up in the first place <laughs> so in that sense and this is definitely gonna be a response to k-wing for those who know that youtuber there was a comment his wife made when they in a dizzy infinity 3.0 video several years back where she said she didn't really see how Padme could be Leia's mom. She was like, oh, Sabine feels more like what Leia's mom should be. And I don't get where that sentiment comes from, but that sequence just shows, on the contrary, we can see where Leia can get her... Hands her, dirty. Yes, and her very proactive nature, and of course getting that from Anakin too, but yes. There are also both senators, if you think about it. Mm. There's that I mean, too. Leia is a senator of Aldron, Rip, mm. and Padme is senator of Naboo. And there are also, okay, technically Padme is not royalty anymore, but yeah, I think these are things that are common too much to say it's a coincidence. What do you guys think? I think if I recall correctly, Bandit Incorporated, when he did this, how the prequel should have been done, he tried to say that there should have been more hints of Leia's personality in Padme that would have led, us, led the audience to believe that she's actually her mother. Which is funny because actually if you take a look at how Leia and Luke are portrayed in the OT and Anakin and Padme in the PT, 
actually it's the opposite like you should like people usually say that oh look skywalker should be like anakin skywalker and oh leia should be like padme but actually some traits of anakin are actually shown more in leia than luke skywalker luke actually resembles more padme amidala especially in episode six if you notice which is actually one of the yeah. reasons why oh. vader when he finally you know sees luke and then and then he redeems himself is because luke reminds him a lot of padme you know, in... was, what Padme was saying before she died was there is still good in him. Yeah, Padme basically, she always definitely saw the good in, in people, which is one of the reasons why even after Anakin had fallen so hard to the dark side in episode 3, she's, she still believed that there, there was still some good left in him, which is ironically what Luke was saying in episode 6. There's that. And Leia, well, she she can be just as arrogant as, say, how Anakin was in episodes 2 and 3. Just as impatient and impulsive and arrogant as Anakin. Which is interesting. Like, people actually get the wrong idea of, of how Luke and Leia should be uh, when compared to their parents. <laughs> that's, the, that's the irony there. <laughs> so, I guess that explains why that person wanted Satine to be Leia's mother instead. You know what you were mentioning, Henson? You know, because they don't really Boring understand. Boring Mandalorian character that barely has any character development in the show. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, that same Satine. So, there's that. But yeah, anything else to mention about Padme? No. Okay, now we go to the next character, which is, well, talking about Mandalorians, let's talk about the Mandalorian himself, Jango Fett. <laughs> and yes, back in 2002, he was a Mandalorian. <laughs> so, keep that in mind. Still is. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> indeed. So, anyway, yep, Django Fed. What do you guys got to say about the Mandalorian himself? I might as well start. Um, <laughs> so, Tamura Morrison as Django Fed, phenomenal. Okay, people who bitch about him, I, I just, I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, one of the complaints was that, um, oh, uh, from Cinema Sins, that humanizing Boba was dumb. Um, I, I kid you not. Um, the fact that us fans of Boba Fett and fans of his appearances. I mean, he's become an iconic character. The fact that we get his backstory in a Star Wars film is awesome. And seeing his dad be this also this badass bounty hunter as well, we see that in motion. Something we Boba Fett fans have been wanting for quite some time. And I just never could understand that criticism that, oh, just for fan service and then that's it. No, there, there is actually a, a freaking point to all of this and i i thought it was great i, I just i just don't know what people are talking about i mean jango fett's existence let's say is a very important aspect of the star wars universe now since he doesn't appear that much in the movie what we can describe his personality is he is ruthless and he is even willing to Wait, the movie doesn't establish the fact that Zam Whistle and Jango Fett are friends, right? So. Well, we can at least see that they are working together. They're like colleagues. At the very least, we can see that. So, so Jango Fett is so ruthless, he's even willing to kill his own colleagues when it comes when they become a detriment to his plans. Yeah. And he's also efficient. Because going around in Coruscant, shooting a laser at a senator while wearing a Mandalorian armor... It would be one of the dumbest things anyone could actually do, right? <laughs> Did you get that, Queen Kid? <laughs> oh, we'll get into him later. Yep. Something, something to mention about Django Fett. So uh, I find it interesting that well, there are actually not many people criticize too much Django Fett's uh, appearance in Attack of the Clones. Like they like seeing him kicking ass against Obi Wan and, and everything. Also, what we can see is. Django actually considers Boba to be his quote-unquote son. Mm -hmm. Which could show how Mandalorian culture works. Can't get more detailed than, than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get later to details of that. So, there's that. Uh, also, since we're talking about Django Fett, can we talk about the Slave One actually being more badass compared to its appearance in Episode 5? Like, in here, we actually see it in action. You need yep. to you add mean, the actually get to see it. why we should think it's a cool ship other than its design. Yep. <laughs> I even think Django Fett's armor looks better than Boba Fett, which is why I have an armor on my bounty hunter that's similar to Django Fett in Swotor. Ooh. <laughs> but but yeah, so Jango Fett, awesome character. Uh, Slave and let's one. see. Mm -hmm. Jango Fett's legacy is a very, very long one. Because the Clone Wars itself 
by the time of the original trilogy, it's some kind of a legendary event that happened in the past. Mm-hmm. And who were those clones and the entire army made up? Jango yeah. Fett. So basically, it's a war against his quote unquote children and a bunch of droids. <laughs> yep. That is true. <laughs> That's just awesome. Indeed. <laughs> yep. Anything else to mention on Jango Fett? I think it would have been interesting to see what would happen if Django would have lived. Um, I think that would have been an interesting twist to see what would have happened because of that. Because, you know, you have the clones fighting for the Republic. He was fighting for the Confederacy at the time. I think that would have been interesting to see maybe later on. And why I would have wanted to see Django Fett, uh, you know, live on. But there's also a point to that because now we know how Bobo Fett will descend down this path where he will struggle his entire life to get to the point where his father is. Mm-hmm. That is correct. More on the part of uh, the Boba Fett series, which right. I'll discuss briefly in the U section. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, now we go to arguably the direct villain of this movie, even though Django Fett also kind of shares that, Count Dooku. So now we get to Count Dooku himself. So I find it interesting that George Lucas decided to make Count Dooku the master of Qui-Gon Jinn. Mm, yeah, that's an interesting one. Because, I mean, it is kind of assumed that Dooku is led to the current Patty's end due to the death of Qui-Gon. And if Qui-Gon was actually alive, he thinks Qui-Gon might help him. I mean, who knows? We don't know the thoughts of a dead man, but... Mm. Yeah. Also, rest in peace, uh, Christopher Lee. Oh, yeah, uh, yes. You magnificent bastard, you. And I don't know what how to describe, but every time he talks, his voice is very satisfying to listen to. I need an audiobook or something. <laughs> uh, well, Christopher Lee, I mean, he was a, a badass. Can you guys believe that Count Dooku, like, it's, it, it's almost like George Lucas specifically created the character of Count Dooku just for Christopher Lee to play him like when you see Count Dooku in episode 2 or and also hell even the behind the scenes and everything and even the shape of lightsaber and like hell even the name Count Dooku like it just sounds like yeah George Lucas must have been a really big fan of Christopher Lee's portrayal of Count Dracula from years ago and he was like I'm gonna have Christopher Lee why not have him as some sort of a count (laughs) another interesting thing about Christopher Lee which I can see is he himself knows fencing which maybe was inspired to was Christopher Lee the guy who actually did his own uh, choreography, right? Did he? Um, no, Christopher. Well, he was a master swordsmanship, but in, in Attack of the Clones uh, and Episode Three, uh, there are some parts that he actually was uh, replaced by a stunt double because you know he was like and, what seventy something years old or sixty something. And, and also I, the guy who did the training for all the actors on how to do swordsmanship. He, he did do some work with uh, Christopher Lee to, to uh, learn how to do fencing. Mm-hmm. What I learned some time ago is like, originally they tried to hire Christopher Lee for Mob Tarkin. Was that true? Uh, so how that happened is basically Peter Cushing, the guy that made Grand Moff Tark in episode 4, so he and Christopher Lee were friends, and they even did some yeah. movies together, you know, Dracula and shit, and so, and so once Star Wars became a hit, uh, and Peter Cushing was in it, well, Christopher Lee was like, maybe I should one day get in Star Wars, and, well, he got the role, <laughs> so that was I mean, it all comes back together. <laughs> yep, so... Indeed. But let's get back now to Count Dooku's character itself. So yeah, uh, master master of Qui-Gon, an expert swordsmanship, both in real life, Christopher Lee, and in Star Wars. Because, uh, you know, Count Dooku. <laughs> what we can know that is, despite Count Dooku being the leader of the Separatists, he is still respected among the Jedi Order, which means he has a certain reputation. Like, he's a political ideologist. It's not in his character to kill someone. Uh, I don't really know about that because that's questionable, but yeah. What we know of him in regards to just the movie specifically, the Jedi have no reason to believe that he would, you know, send an assassin to kill Padme or anybody for that matter. To them, they can't fathom that somebody they knew would go and, well, become evil, let's just say, for simplicity's sake. 
Yeah. It makes sense. Yes, indeed. It's too bad that he appears towards the end of the movie. I wish you could see more of him. Like a third of his? He's mentioned, obviously, across the, uh, across the movie a few yeah. times. But well, that deleted scene at the archives was left in. Uh, yeah, oh, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, there's that. Another thing to mention ab about Count Dooku, aside from the fact that he... Well, it is interesting that we see him trying to persuade Obi-Wan into joining him and tell him that, oh, there's a Sith Lord called Arsidious controlling the Republic. And then we see at the end of the movie, oh, wait, he's serving that same Sith Lord. <laughs> and he was Darth oh. Rhinos all along. I think uh, Dooku does have certain, I don't know, parental feelings or grandparents, I think. Because if you think about it from a certain perspective, Obi-Wan is technically Dooku's grandson. Hmm, maybe. Or more like, uh, well, there's no, there's no specific term for this. I'm just going to say the apprentice of his apprentice. <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, so something like you assume too much. Like he was once my apprentice as you were once his. Mm hmm. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, there is that. So, anything else to mention on Count Dooku? No. No? Okay. Well, now we're going to, I guess, some side characters that we should mention. So, like, like for example, uh, well, we mentioned briefly Sam Wessel uh, with Django Fett. Do you guys got something extra to add to her? No. Does she have an identity crisis or something? Uh, like, well, we both know the reason why that's the case, because she's, you know, a, she's some sort of a shapeshifter. <laughs> so, Claudite, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's a Claudite. Mm -hmm. So, there is that. Um, so, yeah. Okay, well, what other characters? Uh, somebody else may want to talk about Mace Windu or Palpatine? Palpatine. <laughs> you know, the kind of thing with Palpatine is, I think he has less screen time. He does have less screen time than the Phantom Menace, that is true. And Sidious doesn't appear until the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. That's kind of weak, that's kind of odd decision, when I think about it. Uh, I mean, it's meant to show that, I mean, the audience isn't meant to know, unless you can put the pieces see? together, that this whole, the war is orchestrated by Palpatine. That's meant to be a reveal at the end. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I would also like to say that his plan in this movie does make sense. <laughs> yeah. Like in the first film, and it's not just a simple repeat of what he does in the first film, it's just a continuate. It's just the logical continuation of the plan. Manufacture a crisis that'll eventually grant him more and more power. Mm -hmm. And in this oh. case, what he's trying to do, get Padme off-planet... Because she's the most vocal opponent of the Military Creation Act. And then, boom, start yeah, a yeah. crisis, have the Senate vote him emergency powers, boom. Then they have a convenient army, boom. War, war continues, he gains more power, boom, we get into the third movie. He is, quote-unquote, reluctant to accept <laughs> more power. If you know what I'm talking about. He loves democracy. I mean, that, that also offers a nice transition. Because, like, a, a lot of prequel haters, especially when ideas formerly known as Ideas of Ice and Fire, they complain that Palpatine is obviously evil. So, and that the, uh, that the characters in universe should be picking this up and should be automatically figuring out that he's evil. Which is really stupid. They're just using meta bias. They, they, they know from the meta perspective that he is the emperor so they're just just opposing that onto the characters and thinking that they should figure this out but Palpatine is not giving any hints that he's actually evil as far as the context that they have mm -hmm. yeah indeed there's plenty of prequel haters that claim that it should be obvious for everybody that Palpatine is a Sith Lord they should even sense no. it with the force or something but... in the previous movie the movie basically ends with Palpatine. Okay, not end. It was the ceremony, but towards the end of the movie, Palpatine is saying something along the lines of, we will watch your career with great interest. And I'm sure he's still watching his career with great interest because we know what's going to happen in episode three. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, actually, we do. If you remember, there is a scene in episode two where Anakin is talking to Palpatine, and Palpatine yeah. is like, in some way, mentoring him, telling him, "You are the most gifted Jedi I've ever ever met." You know that that scene. <laughs> yeah, Swotor is uh, what basically, but it, he's stroking Anakin's ego. Hmm. No homo. So, so what we could know is Palpatine knows how to communicate with Anakin better than the Jedi Council, better than Obi Wan. Which is obviously the reason why Anakin tends to side with the Chancellor more than the Jedi in Episode Three. Yeah. Pay attention, people. <laughs> well, they don't seriously, seem, man. They don't seem to pay much attention on that. <laughs> so there is that. Anything else to mention on Palpatine or other characters? Let's see, Jar Jar. Well, he wasn't he wasn't too much in this movie, so there's not much to mention. <coughs> Though apparently Stockman got angry that it was Jar Jar who pretty much led the Galactic Republic to its downfall. <laughs> you know, we Okay, yeah, here's cause the he problem with here was the problem with it. It isn't like Jar Jar alone has the power to get, give something to Palpatine. I mean, don't you see all those senators clapping at Palpatine? Yeah, he, he, he literally just said that he, that he suggests that Palpatine be given emergency power. He didn't say, I decree that Palpatine gets emergency power. It has to be a, be a majority vote. Well, If you know not... basic politics, a single senator or a representative cannot just give power mm -hmm. to a politician. That's not how things work. <laughs> yeah, though actually Stockman doesn't hate it because of that. He hates it because, oh, it's Jar Jar the one that made that, not somebody else. It had to be the buffoon from the previous movie to make it. You just had to ram Jar Jar into this movie, George. You just had to. That's how he said it. Jar Jar's Even though he's in the movie for like five minutes. <laughs> Jar Jar's character is still consistent from The Phantom Menace. Now, as we know, what we can see from Phantom Menace is Jar Jar has good intentions and wants to help people, but what he does always doesn't end for good. Now, here's the question I'm going to ask. If Jar Jar didn't suggest the emergency powers, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to let the Confederacy just attack the Republic with their battle droids? <laughs> while the Republic cannot defend themselves? Oh, don't worry, though, one, because there, there is a prequel here that actually has kind of a response to that, and we'll get to it later. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yes, trust me. <laughs> so, there is that. So, the basic point I'm trying to say, even at this attack the clones, Jar Jar has good intentions, but good intentions alone is not enough for the world because there are consequences. Mm-hmm. Yep. Indeed. So, anything else to mention on side characters? No. Okay, well, I guess now we get into the proper criticisms of the general Star Wars fandom. And some if we have some ourselves. Now, okay, it's criticisms, guys. You know which is the first one. Let's get done with this one. The CGI! <laughs> We're gonna continue with this even till the next video, right? Well, the next video we might have something in mind for that, but we need to tackle it here because just as in the Phantom Menace, it is heavily criticized at no end. So, like, CGI, let's get on with it. What specific parts are they talking about? Well, mm -mm. so the argument is that it looks bad in Attack of the Clones because it either looks like an environment resembling a glossy looking video game or a bad looking cartoon that you can't take seriously at all. <laughs> that's your, that's just your opinion, man. Well, I remember Quinn Ideas also making that argument in his Attack of the Clones review, which is part of the reason why he said that he can, he can like the film despite the fact that he actually understood the politics unlike the, like you, like most prequel haters. <laughs> Well, there's yeah. That. He just he just said he couldn't he couldn't take anything seriously with all the horrible CGI. He can't take anything seriously. My fuck. Okay, like similar to the previous argument, I want to see how you do a clone versus droids without CGI, huh? Oh, speaking of that, so. Another argument these people have is that they hate that the movie overutilizes CGI and blue slash green screens over the usage of practical effects, with the worst offenders for this being the Corsan Chase, the Genosis Conveyor Belt, the Genosian Arena Battle, and anything having clone troopers, battle droids, or other full CGI characters on screen. Yes, but then you have to question, define overuse. What does that mean in a movie where, quite frankly, you need CGI 
in green screen slash blue screens in order to it properly do it. Not to mention tons of blue screens were used in the OT. Don't act like they weren't. Episode six in particular. Wait, that goes against the narrative. Oh, let's also not forget that some of these situations that happen in the film would be too dangerous to do if you use practical effects, such as the factory uh, scene. Imagine trying to do all that with actual machinery in a factory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like the actors literally have to memorize the patterns of the machines going up and down or the conveyor belt moving. Or Wait, worse, that sounds more stupid than I thought. Or worse, Padme getting stomped by one of those uh, things that she had to pass below. <laughs> or molten steel coming down. <laughs> that too. So here's, here's the thing. One of the things that should be very obvious, but is lost on these people, is that CGI, or the heavy use, well, I say heavy in quotes, heavy use of CGI is really starting to take effect in the early 2000s. It had been used in more, uh, it was getting more and more usage throughout the 90s, but especially in the early 2000s with these, well, late 90s, early 2000s with their blockbusters. When it comes to new technology, there will be growing pains. In this case, the CGI will get dated. But here's the thing, though. It may get dated, but it laid the foundation so that when we get the next movie, whether it be episode three or another major blockbuster or even a smaller scale film, the CGI will get better and it'll constantly improve until we're at a point like, you know, what we have now where you can have, I'll use Thanos as an example. He looks fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because the technology we have that allows us to make him look as good as he does came from these beginnings. It had to start somewhere. Films are going to suffer. Well, suffer for those who want to be a bitch about it. Mm -hmm. Films are going to have to take the bullet in terms of their dated effects. Star Wars did that. Is the CGI bad? No. No. Bad compared to what? <laughs> if you and, want a case of horrendous CGI <clears throat> during the sim same time, just watch the movie that the Scorpion King appears. Oh, <laughs> I'm showing it right here. <laughs> and as you saw, yeah, that shit. Looks awful. I don't think this, that CGI is personally awful, but uh, uh, I'm but I but we got pl we got plenty of examples. Yes, but let's be real, King. Nothing compares to that awful Scorpion King from the second movie. It I mean, that looks I mean, so even, even I mean, even films that people majority like as some bad in data CGI, like the uh, like the Raimi Spider Man films. The, those CGI did not age well in the first film. Oh, that yeah, that yeah, that is true. That's not aged well too either. But let's be real. I'm pretty sure the Django Henson and the one and and I'm pretty sure even you can agree that Scorpion King looks awful. It looks so fake. Hell, he doesn't even the, the face of the Rock doesn't even look like the Rock. It barely looks like it. It looks straight out of a dirty video game. Or and, a good example is Matrix Reloaded, where the scene where Neo fights bunch of Agent Smith. If you look at it, the character faces look like it's freaking rubber or something. <laughs> it looks horrible. And that I'm too. and I'm sure this is why when it came to something like Star Wars, CGI was more more so used when it came to the alien creatures because yeah, when early CGI when it comes to hyper realistic people tended to look either really bad or unintentionally horrifying. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair to like the like movies like The Matrix Reloaded, it it's not so much that the CGI was bad; it's just that the it couldn't handle doing that many units of Agent Smith at all at once. So some of them were gonna look really bad, while the others looked good enough. That movie was like, and you know what's interesting? Matrix Reloaded came out in two thousand three, <laughs> yeah. so it has less of an excuse compared to Attack of the Clones. 
Yeah. Also, there <laughs> there is another scene that you guys want to see that has bad CGI from movies came that came close to the clones. There's those terrible Hulk dogs in the Hulk movie from 2003. Oh. Like those dogs. Oh, you mean the Ang Lee movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. Those dogs look horrible. Like you can make the argument that, that Hulk himself looked bad or or looked fine for his time, but those Hulk dogs, no, those awful, awful. And here it is. <laughs> Yeah, Hulk did look good. I mean, in terms of the CGI, the CGI for Hulk looked good. The dogs, yeah, I'm, no. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna disagree. I did, I did not really care for the CGI for the Hulk back then. I mean, like in some shots it looked good, but in others it kind of looked. You could tell it was fake. Well, yeah, but then again, the CGI was the least of the movie's problems, though. So. Yeah, so, and right now we're discussing CGI moments in other movies, because people claim that the CGI in Attack of the Clones is some of the worst CGI ever made, and that even back then it was horrible <laughs> compared to other movies. <laughs> One weird thing I especially see, if you see the Green Goblin Glider in Spider-Man 2002, mm. that shit looks fake. I, I love the movie, one of my favorites, but that thing looks fake. <laughs> it's like, it's floating in the air and it looks like it's not supposed to be there. <laughs> there is that too so yeah and um, yeah i mean like the one one of the counter arguments that the prequel trilogy haters like to use is that around this time we had the lord of the rings movies would had excellent cgi uh yeah. the, the effects rings. are on par and lord of the rings had worse green screen effects i mean if you look at lord of the rings it is pretty obvious some of the scenes are green screen green slash blue because oh lord yeah, of the like, rings yeah, has like some of the, yeah, terrible like the, green screen effects yeah you know, like some of the spiders in one of the scenes look <clears throat> be fake now, i also recall some bad cgi in uh in the harry potter films the first seems one like philosopher's stone the yeah. troll yeah it seems like people are overpraising lord of the rings for the cgi because of golem i mean golem looked good and andy circus was a great actor and all but if you actually look at the other stuff, especially the background... Eh, well, I mean, here's the thing. No. The CGI in Lord of the Rings is really good. It's just that the green screen just... You can tell. It is so painfully obvious when they're in front of a green screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it's not as horrendous as, like, the Hobbit trilogy, which is, like, years after. And, like, that one is totally CGI, and the characters look super worse than you know, what is Lord of the Rings. And it's ironic with, like, the sequel trilogy having worse CGI than the prequel I mean, trilogy at times. If you really want to see a movie with full of horrendous-looking CGI, just watch The Thing 2011. Because those things Ugh. look horrible. Oh, fuck. God, ugh. I mean, it's, even to these days, um, we still see these self-entitled critics say that certain movies that have bad CGI, even though they don't, uh, like uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters, which actually does have pretty good CGI for the most part. They'll say that it's awful. They, so, they say the same with the Attack of the Clones and the rest of the prequels. Fly I mean, I, I think part of that is because they already have a have a hate boner for the move for the movie, and then they they just when they're in that kind of mindset, they'll just try to when they find the slightest flaw with the with the effects, they'll try to say that the effects overall is bad. <laughs> that might be a part of it. There's that. Like, even Marvel movies in the 2010s, late 2010s, there are some movies that look horrible. Just look at the fight scenes in Black Panther, where T'Challa's fighting against Killmonger. Seriously, that's horrible. There's that. Uh, I, think, I think Iron Man 3 had some bad CGI in certain parts, too. Uh, no surprise on that one. Um, there is that. Something interesting that we failed to mention, however, as you've seen the video, I've been showing the images. So, yeah, behind the scenes, Tactic Clones actually does have plenty of practical effects. Like, it's not all blue screens and green screens. The only parts that actually have purely green screens or blue screens on the background are the Genosis Battle Arena inside it. Like, not, not the shots from far away, because the shots from far away actually are were filmed with a full-on practical huge ar uh, arena model uh, with a camera outside of it or in front of it. 
So, but whenever you see like the actors on scene, th those are indeed uh, blue screens and green screens. That and the conveyor belt and the scene in which uh, Obi Wan is with the Prime Minister and Tan Wei uh, checking the cloning tanks in Camino. Those are like the only parts that are 100% green screens in the backgrounds. So, I mean, at this point, it should be common knowledge that individual prequel movies had more practical effects than the original trilogy combined. Mm. Yeah. That's more for the Phantom Menace, but Attack of the Clones, yeah, definitely had more practical effects that people give it credit for. In fact, there are some scenes that were entirely practical, besides, obviously, the Tatooine ones, because they were filmed in Tunisia, where, you know, Episode 4 was filmed. The scenes where Anakin and Padme are in Naboo, in particular in the in the lookout house, where they're uh, alone in the, pi in the picnics and dinners, those actually were indeed filmed in actual place, in freaking Italy. <laughs> so, in fact, you're... Yeah, those were beautiful. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're the... You're the screenshots so and dexter's diner from uh, the shot where the camera pan scene close to the building that also was actually a model and the shot of padme's apartment from far away was also a model actually i mean people have acknowledged it but like prequel haters like nostalgia critics said that the dex diner scene was also a bad thing because it didn't look alien enough what yeah re alien. Rem remember remember oh, yeah. when we we actually, when we originally reacted to his reviews, he did uh, mention that it looked too too much like something we would see in our world, not in a different galaxy with aliens. Oh, yeah, because clearly in our world, we're going to see a freaking cook with four hands as well as well as a robot waitress and and some freaking ducks uh, sitting somewhere. Yeah, we're clearly going to see that in our everyday lives. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. The no. critics are dumbass. <laughs> God, Christ. In fact, if he's going to throw that argument, I could easily throw it to the to Masconada's castle in episode 7 where I could make that same argument. But the reason I'm not doing it is because it's a stupid argument in the first place. <laughs> like, seriously? Man, so stupid. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's just mm -hmm. not an argument. Yeah, I did. So there's that that I got to tell about CGI. Uh, any other thing to mention on the CGI... <laughs> Oh boy. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess now we can move on from the CGI. <laughs> so, before we get into some cri into well, the criticism of episode 2, there was one criticism that we that was labeled as Phantom Menace, but we actually skipped on purpose to bring it into this movie because this movie actually addresses it. And it's the criticism that according to episode 5, Obi-Wan was trained by Yoda. But episode one contradicted that by having Qui Gon be his master and not Yoda. Okay. Now, okay, so okay. the thing what Obi Wan said in episode five is Yoda, the Jedi master who instructed me. He didn't say Yoda was the single master. Mm -hmm. There's that, yeah. Uh, and not to mention, let's. This is more so an episode three thing, but keep in mind, Yoda did have more direct training with him in regards to, you know, becoming a force or learning to communicate with Qui-Gon and all that. Yeah, but e even if those even if those two facts were not there, the this, the fact is Attack of the Clones establishes that every Jedi that, jo that joins the Order at a very young age, they're first trained by Yoda as younglings, and then they're taken by other Jedi Masters to be Padawans. That was no, I mean, what I'm, I'm giving an example that's more so Yoda directly training him. Because you know the argument prequel haters have is, oh, he trains all the younglings. The Obi-Wan makes it sound like he was directly taught by him. Hmm. And this is, it could also apply to the ending of episode 3. And we could go deeper, but in episode 3, Yoda says something among something like, your master Qui-Gon has contacted me from the other world. And he taught Obi-Wan about the ways to maintain his conscience even after his death. Didn't he say something like that? Uh, not in the OT, but kind of in episode 3. Episode 3, yeah. So, but yes, so, so episode 2 and episode 3, they already had addressed that criticism from the pretty haters. Apparently episode 5 and, is contracted, but not really. And seriously, think about it. Yoda is the Grand Master, which means even the council members and Jedi Knights will constantly ask Yoda questions to gain some knowledge or 
some guidance. I mean, this is not so far off, is it? No, not really. I mean, and hell, even episode 5 itself says that he's trained Jedi for 900 years. You know, remember that in the OT? For 800 years, 900 years, I trained Jedi. You know that quote? So, <laughs> I guess... you think if these people are actually Star Wars fans. <laughs> they just see the cool flashy stuff and turn up their brains. <laughs> They like the idea of Star Wars. It's hard to really... It's. Oh, I don't believe that they actually care about Star Wars because, in terms of like the deeper lore or looking at thing or looking at the bigger picture, pff, they don't care to learn jack or shit about any of that. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> but they, that's all the fanboys for you. <laughs> so there is that. Anything else to mention on this one? Uh, no. No. Okay. Next one, and it's one, and it's one criticism label uh, somewhere at the beginning of the movie. Uh, apparently, that Sam Wessel should have thought of a better assassination plan than having a probe droid put poisonous worms inside Padme's room through the window. You know, like gassing the place or throwing a grenade or shit. Or Django Fett himself should have killed Padme in the first place instead of contracting uh, Sam to do it. Okay. The first reason Django Fett should directly kill Padme. It's one of the stupidest thing is a Mandalorian with a gun is very noticeable. <laughs> it is, yeah. Seriously, if you actually killed a senator, the whole planet would be in potential lockdown. I mean, how are you going to escape? Do you think you're just going to escape easily after you killed a senator in Coruscant? <laughs> well, no, definitely not. So that's To me, more... it seems like... The worms are the most silent way of killing Padme. I mean, what are you gonna do? Fire a random blaster? <laughs> well, some suggest and that, but, but others suggest that, oh, how about gassing the place or something? You know, like putting some sort of a toxic gas something, or maybe maybe even a grenade with toxic gas or... Yeah, but assuming that the prequels have some something akin to a forensics team, they'll be able to figure that out that there was poison gas, and realize that this was an assassination attempt, and start l looking into it. I mean, with using insects, you could just say that they just somehow crawled into the room, and, and the whole thing was just some accident. Hmm. Yeah. Could say that. Though then, how do you explain the window being uh, cut out a bit? Maybe, well, or, well, maybe the droid would have actually put the small chunk of glass back back there if the plan had succeeded. So, there is that. Any other arguments to, to mention on this one? No. Okay, well, next. <laughs> okay, well, next we're going to tackle one of our favorite EU haters. Confused Matthew! I know how much you love him, though, one. Or love shitting on him. <laughs> so let's get on with My him. My good friend Matthew. Yep. Oh, here. Oh, here's the first one that he brings up. That Matthew claims that the separatists have no good reason for leaving the Republic or creating an army to antagonize the Republic. That it just happened for the sake of the plot. Why is it bad for the separatists to leave the Republic? As in bad he in the eyes of the Republic. No. As you can know, if you watch the movie properly, after how many times was New Gunnery trialed? Like several, maybe five or ten. Several times, New Gunnery was able to go free without any consequences. That alone indicates that the Republic is already useless. Mm -hmm. Now, if you actually look at the other scenes, it's specifically, there's a scene in episode one where Shmi Skywalker says something like, the Republic does not exist out here. We must survive on our own. Which means the Republic is failing many worlds in the Outer Rim. And, you know, the Separatists, obviously, is going to side with the Outer Rim. Because they're against the Republic. It's basic psychology. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, not to mention, it's just building <laughs> off what we saw in the first movie. Like, the whole point... Or one of the major points of The Phantom Menace was to show that the Republic isn't what it used to be. It's mm. corrupt. Things don't get done. It's things, problems just get lost in legal mumbo jumbo. So it's no fucking wonder why you would have planets trying to <laughs> separate from the Republic. Because it's a shithole. <laughs> yeah. Oh, why the Separatists would build an army? very logical 
Do you think the Republic wouldn't use any military force or even send the Jedi to, you know, basically force the Separatists oh. to, into submission? Oh, don't, oh, speaking of that, Dorn, oh, Matthew had another thing to say about that. She said that according to him, the Separatists aren't trying to hurt anyone. They're just trying to lead the Republic. So why is the Republic even having a boat to have an army at all? Especially if it's to assist the Jedi, aka the Guardians of Peace and Justice. So what are the Republic and the Jedi saying here? Stay in the Republic or die? <laughs> Getting the facts wrong, what do you, Ace or Thorn? <laughs> okay, here's the thing. It would be similar to what happened in the Cold War between the U.S. and Soviet Union. You have these, in this case it would be replace the nukes with, um, with armies. You would have these armies just in case something went down. But would they ever be used? Who's to say? But we clearly saw that, yes, the Separatists were creating their own army. Was it in response to the Republic possibly doing that? Or was it just there in case something happened? Who's to say? But the point is, of course, both sides would create their own armies because, quite frankly, again, there's a reason why they left the Republic. Because the Republic sucks. <laughs> and, of course, they would react in a way that said, yeah, we see you as a threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and why would the Republic consider the separatists as danger i don't know because the republic does not want any opposition they don't want the outer rim to complain they don't want the citizens to constantly say you guys are messing up things you guys need to fix this system the bureaucrats the corporations they don't want to listen to any of this they just want to maintain the status quo but what do you think the republic senators want they don't want to because they're actually gaining from the corruption yeah. so if you look at the separatists they're the people who are constantly calling them out. Of course, the Republic wants to silence the Separatists. It's basic politics. There's that. Now, Matthew's wondering why are the Jedi, like, apparently contempt with what the Republic is doing? So, got something... Exactly. As in not doing any... As in letting the Republic pretty much say, Oh yeah, stay in the Republic or die. Or creating the army. <laughs> you know, that stuff. What do you guys got to say about that? That apparently the Jedi being complacent to all of this. That's what he's saying. What Any that? arguments you have, General, on your own? Well, in my case, well, I'd say this. Uh, just, as, just as we said in the previous movie, Jedi, besides following the will of the Republic, they can't really do much on their own without the approval of the Republic. They either do what the Republic right. says uh, what to do, or they pretty much get wrecked. They got wrecked anyway in episode 3, but the point is they can't really do whatever the hell they want, which is something that we're gonna come back to because... No, actually, you know what? Fuck it. Let's get into the next criticism of Matthew because it actually is a, conti is a continuation to that. Because Matthew, he, just like in the previous uh, review, he's, he continues to criticize the Jedi Order for doing nothing about the slavery problems of Tatooine. He's going, even going as far as saying that in the 10 years that Anakin was training under Obi-Wan, that someone in the Jedi Council should have approved to either free or buy Shmi Skywalker to have her be safe and reunited with Anakin. Therefore, avoiding um, all the problems that came in the movie. Okay, there's two counter arguments I'm gonna use. Number one, the reason they don't solve the slavery problem is, like I mentioned in the first podcast, Tatooine and the hut areas are not in Republic territory. <laughs> yeah. You can't just go there and flash your lightsabers and go and kill the huts. That's not how things work. And number two, the whole point of being a Jedi is to move away from personal relationship. Why the hell would the Jedi reunite Anakin with his mother when that's the whole purpose of having no personal attachments or love, etc., etc., etc.? I think these people are these people are just stupid. <laughs> and you know, another criticism is that. Why couldn't Anakin not visit his mother in the first place? I mean, because he's a Jedi, and like you said, though, and like there's not supposed to be any emotional connections allowed, and only until just now that Obi Wan or nobody else is with him that he's able to go see his mother and help find her. You know? Mm hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. And, and you know what's the worst? This is just the beginning. There's more stupidity 
Oh, oh. yes. In fact, we're not done with Matthew. He has two more. <laughs> so the next one is that he claims the Senate somehow circumvented... Well, that it circumvented itself by not allowing the use of clones before the Separatist attack. But thanks to Jar Jar's proposal to give emergency powers to the Chancellor, the clone army was approved for usage anyway. So he's asking, why didn't the Senate approve the use of clones themselves if they're willing to approve of it anyway by giving an emergency power to the Chancellor? So he's basically saying, you could have done this, but instead you did this other thing. Why didn't you do this in the first place? That's, what, that's his argument here. Got something to say on that one? I think that some of the re Republic, by building a direct army, would indicate war, literally. I think the Republic does not want to outright do that unless they have a clear evidence that the Separatists are attacking. Which, ironically, it was actually sh shown in the Senate meeting where Jar Jar made the proposal. In fact, they took that same transmission from Obi-Wan and put it there. I'm not saying that because of novelization, but rather because it is strongly hinted that that was the case. Otherwise, how okay, so they have proved that? Jar Jar decides to bring up the emergency power things after... Obi-Wan sent a transmission discovering the Geonosis factory and all those separatist councils like the Techno Union, the Banking Clan, the Commerce Guild, the Trade Federation, mm -hmm. all these people. And they're saying the trade, the Techno Union army will be in your disposal count. What time more? Mm -hmm. Like, pay attention to the movie. Stop asking dumb questions. <laughs> uh-huh. So, yep, there is that. Indeed. Yeah. And not to, not to mention, before Obi-Wan figured that all that out, not all of the senators are going to easily approve of the creation of the clone army. You know, Padme Vidala was, was uh, one of the strongest opposition, but it doesn't mean she was the only one. There were others like Bail Organa in there too. So... No, now, the reason why the clone army was approved in the end, is, uh, despite in the end, is because, well, there was a threat. The Separatists are actually planning to attack, so everything changed, but... To be fair, it was Anakin who was going around in Geonosis, killing the Geonosians first, well, so, eh. Well, even be even before that, uh, Count Dooku already had, you know, the... Oh, the yeah, Federation they conferences. already had the army. Yeah, they already, and the treaty signed, so... So it was inevitable, even if Anakin didn't go there. So there is that. And then the next, the next one that <laughs> goes back to one one of the previous arguments that we talked about, that Matthew claims that it is so obvious that the clone army was created in secrecy by traitors of the Republic that just so happened to be linked to the Separatists. And yet, the Jedi are dumb enough to play along with it and use the clone army. Rather than deduce that the clone army was created by traitors, so they should destroy it and have the Republic create its own army. Actually, no. The only information the Republic or the Jedi knew was the fact that Sipo Diaz commissioned the army about 10 years ago and Jango Fett was recruited by a man called Tyrannus. Now, unless you're counting the supplemental material, at this point, the Jedi do not know that Tyrannus is Dooku. So don't even bring that stupid excuse. Actually, even if we bring that supplemental material, they didn't even know. Uh, they didn't know Tyrannus was Dooku all along. They never knew. Yeah, so... So Tyrannus could be anyone. So there is no way the Republic could trace it back to Dooku, back to Palpatine, or... The Separatists. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and no, the Separatists were not related. Well, it was just uh, Palpatine. Well, apparently Matthew claimed that the clone army was linked to the Separatists. <laughs> the clone army is linked to the Separatists? Yeah. What kind of drugs is he on? Uh, apparently the same drugs that Blanket took later on. <laughs> Oh boy, so... They come from the same stupidity that you see from Plinkett, Stalge Critic, Kara, Ace of Thorn, so on and so forth. They're just all idiots who can't take it. They're just, once they get, once they think they see a problem, which really isn't, they'll just like try to deconstruct it and try to make themselves seem intelligent. Yet when they just actually pay attention to the movie and get their facts straight, they realize they're complete idiots. So yeah, Matt, you like what? Like what the hell with you saying that? Oh, apparently the Jedi are dumb enough to play to play along. Like there's n there's no real evidence that the clone army is, is linked to the separatists, which <laughs> he claims that it was that it was a separatist. 
Oh god, it's ju it's just utter stupidity in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, and this is what like just half the stupidity, because then we have to tackle the big the biggest lord, the PT haters himself. Oh, that's gonna be fun. <laughs> so there's that. Anyway, that's confused Matthews other nonsense so now we get to the nonsense that others claim so one of the ones that i've heard is that apparently the dialogue is worse here than the phantom menace more cringe more awkward more everything now i'm not talking about the romance itself yet i'm talking about the movie in general so <laughs> got something to say about that that the dialogue is well, worse well aside from the romance the dialogue seemed pretty normal to me hmm. fair enough Anything else to mention on that, guys? Uh, Dolan, Henson, Django? Uh, it's important yeah. to keep in mind the influences Lucas had. And also, these are two people who aren't used to this kind of talk, let's say. Especially in the case of Anakin, who's, you know, already awkward enough. Just add on to the fact that he's letting his true feelings be known to somebody he loves. Uh, of course, the dialogue is going to sound weird. It's being said by someone who's awkward as hell. Not to mention Padme is also isn't really used to this. Like she's been in relationships before, but not like this. There's that, uh, yeah. Something else to mention about the dialogue? No. Okay, next one, ah, a criticism that returns from the previous one and from one of our favorites, Stuckman. He brings once again the same criticism of The Phantom Menace where most of the movie is just people sitting around walking and talking with nothing interesting going on in the background. Just pure uninteresting expository talks which makes it boring to watch the movie. <laughs> it's called world yeah. building, you idiot. <laughs> Got something to say, that one? How you say? He keeps saying the word boring. I don't think he knows what that means. I don't think so either. But that's him. He claims every everything is boring. And I find it interesting that just with saying the Phantom Menace, Empire Strikes Back also had a lot of expository talk. And yet we don't see people bitching about that. <laughs> so. You know, it's in inter interesting from uh, Chris Stuckman because he's in the business of criticizing films. And he, I, I mean, there's a lot of like these... Some of these very specific indie films out there that are super boring to watch. And there's like this one, I think it was called A Ghost Story, where it's like 20 minutes of a woman eating a pie or something like that. Huh. And he had no problems with that movie whatsoever. Huh. So it's interesting to see that come into play when it comes to that. In the indie scene, he doesn't have any problem with that. But when it comes to Star Wars, he expects action and all this other stuff like the original trilogy you know if it's like talking be it that it's he has an issue with he wants to see action and that's it but it, like we said it's world building but it goes by pretty quickly it's actually pretty uh, quickly paced it's not like uh, super slow or anything like that it's actually flies by pretty quickly yeah you need these kind of world building exposition for the story to work and actually have payoff on things because we've seen what star wars looks like when it doesn't have those things <laughs> sequels everything we get and this goes for all the films in the trilogy everything we are given is important to understand the plot the current state of the galaxy and why we should care about what's happening mm -hmm. Hey. Yeah. Oh, building off to that syncretism, Stockman claims that Jedi Council once again sitting around in their council chambers just talking, not doing anything until the end of the movie. You know, the, until the Maybe. Genosis battle arena. Wait, so you think the Jedi Order can just send their people to do whatever they want? Apparently. I mean, that's not how it works. In order for Jedi to do business related to Republic, they need to get the approval for the Senate or from the orders of the Chancellor. Apparently, the Senate nor the Jedi... I mean, you can blame the Senate and the Chancellor. <laughs> and eventually... I mean, <laughs> that is not a criticism. <laughs> well, apparently he made it one, but <laughs> there is that. Anything else to mention on that stupidity from Stockman? Because here's the next stupidity from him. 
This next one is, Stugman is then asking, how the hell can Jedi procreate if they're not allowed to marry and have children? Do they just look for people to breed with? Ugh. No, they... Oh, they, they, take, they, they take... They go around the galaxy and take a children into their order. A moron! Fucking moron! Uh, well, this was established in the first movie. You mean episode one? Yes. <laughs> well, they asked the parents, so they like. <laughs> Why God literally recruits Anakin in the first movie? I mean, this is very similar to how how uh, X Men: The Last Stand, how how Charles Xavier and Magneto uh, recruited Jean Grey into their academy. They learned that she was a gifted mutant, and they talked to the parents about having her join their academy. It's similar to that. They learned that some of these children are Force-sensitive. They talked to the parents about uh, having them join the Jedi Order, and they give their consent, and then they joined it. Hmm. It's not that complex. <laughs> uh, but it seems that it is complex for him. <laughs> so there's that. Then another dumb question he asks is, why is Anakin not doing a better job at hiding his Padawan status when protecting Padme in foreign locations, you know, like covering his Padawan braid? <laughs> why, why, would he, why would he need to hide that? Yeah. yeah. Should he wear, like, so, a big hat to protect his braid? Like, I mean, what's seriously, the point? Actually, being a Jedi is better when it comes to protecting because even assassins aren't really dumb enough to go to a Jedi and directly try to fight them. <laughs> Yeah, unless there are assassins that have had experience fighting Jedi before, <laughs> Jango Fett, but that's about it. So, but yeah, no, but he's but he's like specifically saying hiding the Padawan braid, so that way assassins and others don't see. Oh, he's just a Jedi in trainee, so I can take him down. I mean, not a lot of people know about the Jedi ranking system. Yeah, I could go d further into that, but that would go into like expanded universe material. Yeah. You, you know the thing is like people the people in the galaxy always think that the jedi are they have the stereotype that they're they're uh, child stealers when they're not they actually ask the parents for that so they have this stereotype going in i mean and even some on some planets there are people who've never even heard of jedi yeah they and mostly the jedi are discussed as some kind of a uh, powerful warriors who use sorcery to fight against their enemies so yeah and they're invincible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, again, Stuckman failed to realize that world building. <laughs> so there's that. Now... Stuckman fails at a conceptual level. Oh, don't... Oh, oh, get ready, the one. But here's the next one that only Stuckman mentions, but some others mention, like Blinket, and a few others. Like, a lot of people claim that the asteroid field chase in Attack of the Clones is a straight-up rip-off from Empire Strikes Back asteroid chase. But they claim that Attack of the Clones has no real tension or suspense or build-up like there was in Empires. <laughs> yes. No, Obi-Wan <laughs> is trying to escape from Jango. Isn't that enough tension? And... I actually like this asteroid thing yeah. because it kind of gives a reason how Boba Fett knows that Han Solo might actually be hiding behind an asteroid in Empire Strikes Back because mm. that's exactly what Obi-Wan did to hide from him and his father. Hmm. Yeah, you could say that. However, we need to tackle this, this straight up criticism that, oh, it's a straight up rip off from Empire Strikes Back asteroid chase. Like no, it's not. Okay, so who wants to say what happened in Empire Strikes Back Asteroid Chase? Like who wants to say uh, the one attacked the clones? Who wants to do which one? One by one. Uh, okay, <laughs> now the thing is, the difference between Empire Strikes Back Episode 2, Jango is attacking Obi-Wan so he can escape from him. It is the office for, in Empire Strikes Back. The Empire is attacking Han Solo in the game so he will not escape. Mm -hmm. so... The reason why they're attacking... The other has different reasons. One is attacking to escape. One is attacking to prevent someone from escaping. Mm. Well, I, I'd have a better comparison. So Han Solo was basically escaping from the Empire after being chased sin ever since uh, he escaped the planet of Hoth. Whereas in episode 2, Jango Fett was heading to Geonosis, but Obi-Wan managed to intercept him, and so they instead went to some sort of a dogfight. And so Jango Fett tried to destroy Obi-Wan so that he could not report the location of Geonosis. The context is very different. 
So there is, a, oh, and also the asteroid chase in, in Empire Strikes Back, not only de dealt with the Millennium Falcon and four TIE fighters, and in episode two was a single Jedi Starfighter against a, a modified version of a mercenary Air ship. Spray. Yeah, the spray, which also has all sorts. Oh, and, and by the way, Empire Strikes Back only has the Money Falcon escaping with TIE Fighters uh, firing. In Episode 2's, we have the Slave 1 showcasing its entire freaking potential from not only its lasers and missiles to, of course, the Sonic Mines, which destroy lots of shit. Seismic charges. Yeah, some call them Sonic, Sonic Mines, some call them Seismic Charges. <laughs> so, uh, that's either one. So, so... Yeah, like, the context is very different in both. And visually, they're not just because, oh, it's an asteroid field, so immediately they're the same. No, they're not the same. <laughs> like, how can you say they're the same just because they have asteroids in both? <laughs> that's, that's I guess we're all the same because we have eyes and mouths and ears. That was like saying that... It would be like saying that... Oh, Endor is the same as Naboo in episode 1 because both have trees and wildlife. <laughs> oh, God. Like, that's so stupid. Oh, God. And I hate to bring this up. Oh, who am I kidding? We, we all know I love to do this. But if you get pissed off about the prequels supposedly ripping off the original trilogy, why do you give a pass to the sequels? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Force Awakens. It isn't like the original I'm trilogy was completely original at all. I mean, look at how many things they got from Flash Gordon or the footage from World War II. I mean, who I are mean, you the thing, though. Star Wars from the very beginning has just been taking scenes and ideas from other works and recontextualizing them to make something new. Mm hmm. Yep. But apparently th these people, well, forgot that and claimed that the asteroid chase in episode 2 is a ripoff of episode 5s. So, <laughs> there's that. So, yeah. However, unlike the sequels, where those are blatant ripoffs to the point they're so obvious it's not even being subtle, uh, at least in episode 2, it actually does it a lot differently. Yes, both have asteroid fields in them, but doesn't mean they're exactly the same. Hell, not even the same context. So... There's that. So yeah, anything else to mention on that one? No. Okay, now we get to the next one, which is probably the only criticism I actually think is kind, it's a bit legitimate, that Anakin's slaughter of the Tusken Raiders was cut short with the slaughter scene quickly transitioning to Yoda in the Jedi Temple instead of letting the audience see like at least a few seconds, maybe 10, 15 more seconds of Anakin showcase, showcasing his full unrestrained anger against the Tusken Raiders. Like a few extra seconds of Kim killing some of the warriors of the Tusken Raiders in full, in full force. That I think should have at least been there, but the reason why it was not there is to keep the movie PG instead of PG-13. I kind of disagree because I, I, I feel like though, you know, it, it would have been too violent and people would have been just a little upset about that. But when it pans to, when it goes to Yoda and you see him just in pain, you feel that and you can hear like the like some noises in the background, even Qui-Con reach out and say, no, Anakin, you get that sense oh, of I don't, like no, that no. pain. No, I'm not saying that the Yoda scene being there is bad. No, no, what I'm saying is that we should have seen a bit more of Anakin showcasing oh. his anger before transitioning to Yoda. Because yeah, yeah, even, yeah. no, even the novelization it's... went a bit in detail on that. So it should have been there in the movie, even if it was a few seconds, like just like at least just like, even if it's just a few more warriors, it would have been fine. It didn't have to be a full, one minute scene 30 like just a few seconds and it seems that george knew about this criticism because with episode three we actually do see anakin you know murdering the the separatists in cold in cold blood and mustafars and getting that to the pg-13 so i mean i don't think that was a result of that i mean hmm. Roger the sith was designed to be more dark violent well that than is the other <laughs> movies well that is true yeah that is true. It's service purpose, so I don't have a problem with it. Hmm. Yeah. I think the other com the complaints that I'm hearing, and I think this was from uh, CinemaSins, he, he complained that when he arrives back from the, uh, like, the his transition from when he's holding his mother to all of a sudden going down the dark side. I mean, the thing is, like, you finally get a chance to see your mother after 10 years, and you don't know whether she's become a slave or anything at this point and the first time you see her again 
is her dying in your, your arms, and she's meant the world to you. You're telling me you wouldn't transition down the dark side after that point and slaughter everyone at that point for what they've done to your mother? Like, of course. I mean, why not? Yeah. As horrible as it sounds, like, I would want to get, I would kill everyone at that point. I mean, as dark as it sounds. Not to mention Anakin is, as we've already discussed, not emotionally, or is emotionally unstable. Exactly. So, yeah, the reaction makes total sense. And also keep in mind, he regrets what he's done, or the very least feels heavily conflicted on it, given a scene we get shortly after. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. Oh, but prequel haters dismiss that scene because it's it, they just complain because it's more Anakin being whiny about it. Uh, that was like Hayden Christensen's like best scene, like the way he transitioned, like just talking to his mother and then just transitioned down to the dark side. That was like the best moment for him. Mm -hmm, yeah. No, I really don't get it in that he plays the character exactly how he's meant to in terms of what Lucas wanted. They complain that he's too whiny. And then they also say that Hayden Christensen can't act, even though they're criticizing the character for what he's meant to be doing, but then also saying that, oh, he's a terrible actor, even though he's convincing me that he is a whiny little bitch. <laughs> God. That's something. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Anything else to mention on that one? No. Okay. Well, next. Oh, 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 this is oh, this is probably gonna be a favorite <coughs> for all you four to tackle. Too many lightsabers being shown across almost the entire movie instead of just being a few lightsabers in select moments in the movie, <coughs> like in the OT. Shut up! It's a different era. There's a <laughs> lot Jedi. More Jedi means more lightsaber. Do the math, idiot. Well, Not to mention, I don't know, I have no, and this just goes back to the my point earlier of these people don't really care about Star Wars or the great, the bigger picture. <laughs> like, this isn't the original trilogy, which was on a much, much, much smaller scale. And also no not Jedi. having the effects necessary in order to pull something like this off. Like, what the fuck do you expect us to see? And weren't people like Jen Sarai saying that they wanted to see uh, thousands of Jedi in battle? I mean, granted, he said that he specifically said he wanted to see thousands of Jedi versus thousands of Sith, like in uh, Star Wars The Old Republic. But there's yeah, and Jen another... Sarai's a fucking idiot in that regard. Yeah, yeah but that scene's... With that being said, isn't this what some of the prequel heroes want? They wanted to see thousands of Jedi at their peak in battle. So you're getting what you want, assholes. Actually, uh, what Jensen Roy said is not actually that criticism, because actually, prequel haters, uh, what they don't want to see is so many lightsabers on screen. So that means they don't want to see a lot of Jedi or a lot of Sith getting their lightsabers out and fight. So basically, even Old Republic lovers, even those people that like the Old Republic seeing that, well, let's just say that if they got their wish, the prequel haters would hate it no matter what. Doesn't matter what era it would be, they just don't want to see so many lightsabers on screen. That's no, there was a devil stupid arguments. There was like a stupid argument Hello Greedo made back in the day. Like, he said in the original trilogy, the lightsabers felt so cool and mysterious because it was <laughs> used in specific moments, not shining all the time. And it makes me wonder. Mysterious? Maybe, what? Not mysterious, but it, something amongst the light up, it felt more special because it wasn't used multiple times. Which makes yeah. me wonder about whether he understands the reason why there's so many lightsabers. I don't you know. know. It is, it's that peak of the Jedi. It, it really does baffle me because you'll have these guys. They'll pick specific things to think deeply on or to think about these things on a deeper level. Like, oh, lightsabers, they mean this, this, and this. But, oh, what's the plot of this movie? I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Seriously. I mean, it's like, you look at a lightsaber, and how else is it supposed to be used? 
I mean, seriously, what do they expect? Do they expect the Jedi to go out in the field and use blasters? <laughs> or their fists? I mean, I, I mean think, the Jedi need a weapon, right? I think what they want is less Jedi on screen and less Sith on screen. Th this what? argument just proves that they don't really like Star Wars. Because uh, why would what's one be... of the most defining characteristics of Star Wars? The lightsaber. Mm -hmm. And when we have something where there are a lot of lightsabers, which I want to remind people makes total fucking sense given the context of when this is taking place, they just don't like Star Wars. If you don't want to see lightsabers that fucking badly, then watch anything else. I mean, why wouldn't there be a lot of Jedi? Uh, no idea. Also, Do they even know the era where this movie is taking place? Uh, no idea. Don't care. This, is like, don't... this is like 22 years before the Battle of Yavin. <laughs> yeah. Where but... the Jedi are still servants of the Republic. And they they're have numbers like 10,000 of them running around in the galaxy. Mm-hmm. But no, they don't seem to care about that. Also, here's something. Jedi without lightsabers is the same as having Harry Potter's wizards without wands. It's the fucking same. And yet, we don't see people saying how, oh, Harry Potter should have that many wizards using wands. Oh, that's because Harry Potter didn't have a story that only had, like, one wizard, and he only took out the wand a few times before we got the books... Aren't the Jedi based on the Samurais? Mm. Kind of. In some ways, yeah. They're based off a lot of Eastern warriors along with some Western warriors, too. Yeah, so that's like watching a Samurai movie and complaining, Oh, why do these Japanese soldiers all have swords? <sighs> yeah, if you think about it, it sounds stupid. It is very stupid. And another criticism to add up to the lightsabers is that some people hate that. Well, they, they're they like wondering, why is Mace Windu having a purple lightsaber instead of the standard blue and green like it was established in the OT? You know, the colors of the Jedi. Okay. This is kind of mentioning the EU, but originally pre-episode 2, Mace Windu did have... What lightsaber did he have? Uh, blue blue one. one. Yeah, but... I mean, so what? I mean, if you kind of think about it, in 1983, why does Luke suddenly have a green lightsaber? Well, apparently people don't, don't, they're not wondering that. They just thought, oh, blues and greens are the standard colors of the Jedi no, for no, the no, Star I'm Wars. Actually, I'm actually asking the question. I thought there were only two blue and red lightsaber. Why does Luke suddenly have a green lightsaber in Return of the Jedi? <laughs> well, there's that question, but all the fanboys don't seem to care. They just rolled along with it. So... There's that, but a per At but when somebody point, has... we do have a lot of weird lightsaber colors like black, white, or even silver, There's or yellow, yellow. Mm -hmm. yeah. orange at times. Like so, and and I gotta ask, what like? Who cares that there's one Jedi with a purple lightsaber? It's not... I mean, honestly, this is getting into nitpicking territory. It is. Seriously. I mean, it's not a nitpick. Because him having a purple lightsaber doesn't hinder any aspect of the film. Yeah. Or the lore of Star Wars. I mean, it's kind of weird that these people actually think the double-bladed lightsaber is cool for some reason. But when it comes to the lightsaber color of Mace Wind's lightsaber or others that are not blue and green, they're, they like bitch about it. <laughs> it's serious. <laughs> I mean, it's Jammo Jackson. Yeah, I mean, I saw the behind the scenes. He just asked George Lucas, uh, is there a chance to purple? And George was like, we could give you purple. And they gave him purple. And you know what? It was pretty cool. Like, what was the problem with that? Yeah. Because it should be noted that Jackson's <laughs> favorite color is purple. And if you kind of know about Star Wars and not actually freaking normies, purple lightsabers existed way before the prequel trilogy. <laughs> just look at Mara Jade. Oh, wait, these people are normies. <laughs> so I mean, hell, Kiati Mundi had a purple lightsaber at one point, yeah. So, but, but anyway, that's getting to the EU territory. Point is, he has a purple lightsaber. Deal with it. Doesn't change anything. Point is, there is literally nothing to complain about. Mm -hmm. This isn't even a nitpick. <laughs> this doesn't hinder any aspect of the film. Mm hmm Or Star Wars lore itself. So. There's that. 
Now, continuing with lightsabers, because there's another big one that gets criticized so uh, much. Uh, yes, uh, n <laughs> it was one you wanted to tackle, though, one. You are using a lightsaber and fighting Count Dooku in a lightsaber duel because it is one of the dumbest moments in the entire Star Wars saga. <laughs> and the reason being? Because not only does it look stupid seeing Yoda doing all of those flips and all that shit, but it also contradicts what Yoda said in Empire Strikes Back, which was that it wasn't all about physical strength or showcasing fighting abilities for weapon, it was more about the Jedi relying a lot more on using the Force for knowledge and defense, not for using weapons like the lightsaber to attack. Oh wait, if you pay attention to the movie, how Dooku said something like, it seems our battle with the Force cannot be decided. Instead, we must use our lightsabers to finish the battle. Oh wait, they tried to find each other using the force and it didn't work out, which led to a lightsaber fight. <laughs> Pay attention to the movie. Yeah, and like Obi-Wan said, a lightsaber is a Jedi's light. Well, apparently for and... some reason, they, they really, really hate Yoda using a lightsaber. Like, they really hate it. Like, Belated Media, Stuckman, and some uh, and others, they the, really the hate Nostalgia Critic. Yeah, they real no, actually, that makes sense. actually yeah. nostalgia critic kind of liked uh, seeing Yoda using a lightsaber. Actually, he's not one of those that hates it a lot. But yeah, so no, no, he no, he also said that he, he kind of hates it because he because he because he felt that Yoda should be so powerful that he doesn't need a lightsaber. Mm, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But he did say uh, at the end it looked kind of even if it looked a bit silly. He said it was kind of cool. But no, the people that really hated it with passion are belated media, cinema scenes, Stuckman, and I think even Hello Greedo at one point. Like what about confused Matthew? Oh, I think he also yeah, hated. But, yeah, <laughs> but Dooku was also as powerful as Yoda. Well, due uh, to the dark side. Actually, if you see the movie, Yoda actually beat him in the lightsaber duel, so Dooku was forced to flee. I mean, in, in the Force, they decided to fight each other with the lightsaber because it was pointless constantly trying to throw debris at each other using the Force. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Yoda was fighting against Dooku was to defend Obi-Wan and Anakin from Dooku. Mm -hmm. You know, the Jedi uses their powers for knowledge and defense <laughs> yep uh, they must think that the, the whole defense thing may, is only applicable to self-defense they probably do so no surprise there it's it's really ironic that people are now hating on the lightsaber moments with yoda when he activates that lightsaber i remember seeing it in theaters and i remember this vividly everyone was cheering and having a great time I remember that in my theater too. Everybody was cheering. Everybody. Yeah, my dad said the same thing that the theater erupted. Yeah, everyone loved that moment. <laughs> wow. So apparently, prequel haters they just really weren't the minority. But when they <laughs> when they spread their their wings and their influence in the late two thousands, when everybody started hating it, <laughs> how interesting. But yeah. So <laughs> also, can I mention a lightsaber is a weapon of a Jedi? So why wouldn't Yoda, being a Jedi, not have one? Like, just because he didn't have one in Pushback Back doesn't mean he always didn't have one. But then, then again, Yoda's a Grandmaster and he trained an entire Jedi Order. How would the Jedi know how to use a lightsaber if Yoda did, never used one? <laughs> Explain to me that uh. one! <laughs> Explain to me that one, seriously. How can it... Like, how can the Grandmaster of the Jedi, the trained Jedi for 900 years, like, if he never used the lightsaber, how does all the Jedi Order know how to use a lightsaber? Or even know how to construct it? Not to mention, Yoda does things. He's not just trapped in the temple. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anything else to mention on that one? I would just like to point out that this is arguably the most impressive sequence in the entire movie because I'm spacing on the guy's name, but the double for Christopher Lee in this scene, he had to fight nothing. <laughs> Look how well actor. it turned out. That is impressive beyond belief. And then don't forget, and then don't forget later in episode three with Ian McDermott's uh, double pretty much having to do, you know, the same against Yoda. So there you go. 
And not to mention, Frank Hawes has a fucking voice. The sounds he makes in that scene. Jesus ah! Christ. <laughs> you know that. Boy, isn't that the Lego Yoda dead sound? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. So, there you go. And I would also like to add that Yoda bouncing around and all that makes sense. He's calling upon the Force to do that. And as we clearly see, once the battle or once the fight is over, he's exhausted. Yeah. Like what we saw with Dooku after he whooped both there, after he whooped Kenobi and Anakin's asses, he was exhausted. So, you know, it's not like Yoda suddenly goes from being weak and limping to god mode. <laughs> Yeah. So there yeah. is that. <laughs> Fucking people. <laughs> and shall we now get into... <laughs> uh, to uh, probably the number one biggest prequel hater of all time. Arguably the face of the prequel hate train itself. You know him, guys. We know him. It's none other than freaking Harry S. Plinkett, also known as the Lord of the Prequel Haters. Oh, yes. Mike Stacossa. Yes. Mm hmm. Indeed. So, now. Stacossa. Mm hmm. And, well, let's get on with it. His review on Attack of the Clones. So, first thing he does is that he claims that the entire movie is all bad. With the exception of seeing hot women in the movie, including Natalie Portman. Yeah, that's his, that's his first argument. That the entire movie is bad, except for seeing hot women in it. This is not even worth dealing with, Skip. <laughs> then it he... should be noted that the review, like all the other Plinkett reviews, has a comedic spin on it because Plinkett himself is meant to be a character. But mixing in jokes with valid criticisms is, in my opinion, never a good idea. Because so this is just dumb. Yep. Then he claims that Attack of the Clones is worse than the Phantom Menace. How? I've never understood why people think Episode 2 is worse than Episode 1. Okay, well. even if it is, is that an argument? <laughs> Well, he made it as one, but then... I mean, some people... Okay, he's trying to say that Attack of Clones is so bad, it's even worse than Phantom Menace. I mean, I... People could say, eh. I mean, I like both movies, but I think eh, Phantom Menace is kind of better than Attack of Clones. Just because the sequel is may, may, is potentially not as good as the previous film doesn't mean, mean it's automatically bad. Look at... Yeah. I mean... A lot, I mean, it's a common opinion that most people think that uh, Empire Strikes Back is better than Return of the Jedi, but people still like Return of the Jedi for the most part. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's that, yeah. So one of the criticisms of Plinkett is that the entire story of the movie is nothing but a jumble of puzzles all awkwardly mixed up together. Like he claims that it's like multiple stories all put into one, stitched into one. That's what he said in one of his arguments. Eh, uh, I don't know what that means. And I don't even want to bother to know. Well, I'll just say this. That argument applies more to Rise Skywalker, considering that that feels like it's like multiple side quests of a video game mixed into one, so... Or his reviews. <laughs> that too. A kind of, kind of confusing review, which is hard to differentiate between jokes and actual yeah. criticism. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Then Blinkett claims that just like The Phantom Menace, this movie has no main character. Once again, bringing that same criticism. It's Anakin. Skip. <laughs> yep. Then he claims that the, everyone in the movie is emotionless. That they show no emotion whatsoever. Well, that's not true. <laughs> well, it's definitely there not. There are true. multiple instances where characters are annoyed, angry, happy... Sad, annoyed, I mean, devastated, I'll see, and I'll see emotional people. outbursts. It's Quit like playing. how, uh, how you're either stupid or you're intentionally misrepresenting the movie. And all you prickle haters say that Anakin is whiny, then how can Anakin be whiny if he doesn't have emotions? Hmm. Well, that's a good one. So, there's that. Then he claims that 
anyone can replace any important person in the Senate. Like replacing a senator easily. <gasps> yeah, he actually claims that you can easily replace a senator just by asking to do so. And do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he said that. No kidding. Because apparently he thinks that anyone can easily replace Senator Amidal and take her place. Uh, no. Okay, here's the reason why Charger was the represent replacement. He was also from Naboo. Mm-hmm. He was Presentation also... of the Gungans. Mm-hmm. I mean, skip. That's stupid. Okay. That's stupid. Then, in this review, like, it seemed like Plinket still had a hate boner for the Phantom Menace because he, he seemed like he wanted to try to shit on both Attack of the Clones and the Phantom Menace simultaneously in this video. Like, both at the same oh. time. Well we, well, we can definitely confirm he has an, ex an excessive hate boner for the Phantom Menace because he was still bashing on the prequels when he did his Force Awakens review. Of course he did. Then he claims, oh, another criticism coming from the Phantom Menace review, that there is no clear villain whatsoever in this movie. <laughs> Maybe you can't figure out the, the who the villain is because you're so damn retarded, Plinkett. <laughs> it's Dooku, it's Django, it's Newt Gunray. It's Phidias. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, it's freaking obvious. Huh? But Blanket, for some reason, doesn't seem to... Do the sense. villains need to be shown immediately? Like, that's... I mean, that's not how some movies work. Like, that's not always clear-cut. Even then, we... Even then, we get to see Django and Sam almost at the beginning of the movie, so at least we had those yeah. points pretty clear. Exactly. So... There's that, but I, th I think he was too drunk uh, to see that. And speaking of being drunk, then he has this awkward, awful skits of him literally torturing a hooker. And then he made some women clean up an entire mess of puzzles, like trying to be find every single piece of, of these puzzles. He yeah, he did that. Like, he was torturing. Yeah, very shit. funny. Very uh, funny. I don't know what that means. No, nah, no. Nah. It was just, he yeah. was just him trying to be funny, but it just looked horrible. Comedian genius. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Well, like I said, Plinkett's a character. That's his character. Now, does it belong here? I think when you're critiquing something, you shouldn't try putting some kind of spin on it like he does here, because it just distracts. And waste time. There's that too, because for a review that's over an hour, there is nothing of substance, like, at all. People, just because something is long doesn't mean it offers anything of value. Length doesn't equal quality. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> Indeed. Then, the next criticism is that he claims that the movie is more don't show, tell. That it prefers to tell us more about the movie and its characters rather than show us more about them. That's what he says. Huh. So basically, so basically he's saying that instead of the movie doing the... Show, movie don't do more, tell. Yeah, show, don't tell. That, it's, that the movie should do more than that. the opposite. Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, thoughts on that one? I don't... Does he, uh, does he mention any scenes in particular? Or is he just throwing these words? He just throw it. <laughs> so, yeah. there's that. Then he claims that the plot is nonsensical and that George Lucas is just throwing the plot at our faces. Your review is nonsensical. <laughs> well, there's that. Then he's asking, why is Padme still using decoys to protect herself despite no longer being the Queen of Naboo? I don't know. Because she's Maybe... still a politician and a very important person and they still need to be protected. You dumbass. <laughs> There's that. No one? Yeah, I mean... Many people would want to kill Padme. Mm -hmm. For example, Newt Gunray wants revenge for the events that happened 10 years ago. Or maybe other senators who want the army or the Republic wants to kill Amidala. Mm -hmm. I mean... You could also say Palpatine himself secretly would want her killed. Nah, Palpatine would want to remove her into a different location rather than kill her. Well, oh well, yeah, but uh, I'm just making the argument that that, yeah. the most, that a lot of people would want her dead, especially after what happened in The Phantom Menace. Oh uh, yeah. So there is or, that. Or maybe the people who are benefiting from the Trade Federation would want Padme dead. Mm-hmm, yeah. 
So there's that. Of course, it makes sense that Padma would have lots of enemies. She needs decoys. So there's a that. A politician always has enemies. Mm. Whether the politician, he or she, is a good person or not, it's not exactly matters, but yeah. they have enemies. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So there's that. Then Plinket claims that the Jedi Council should have just sent two more, more than two Jedi against Darth Maul and the Phantom Menace. That way they would have assured victory easily. <coughs> Wait, why is he suddenly mentioning the Phantom Menace? Because again, he has a hate boner for it. Okay, let's deal with this thing again. <laughs> Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were discreetly sent by Chancellor Baloram. It wasn't like multiple Jedi were sent to deal with the Trade Federation. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, oh, and can we also mention that the Jedi Council couldn't really do much during the events of the Phantom Menace? Because not only the Republic would not, didn't really care much about what was happening on Naboo, but they also were in the middle of electing a new Chancellor. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but there you go. Then he decides at one point that he wanted to see Paul Blurt Mall Cop put into this movie for some reason. Oh god. <laughs> yeah, he actually wanted him in this movie. Why? No idea, he just said it. It's just, it's stupid. <sighs> and then he calls Sand Hill Count Chocula. Then he calls What Tambor Rosie the Robot. And then he calls Humai a racist cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> yep. Uh huh. Let that sink in. He actually did that. So keep that in mind. What? Well, wait. Anyway, speaking about racism, I think I think I also remember. I, I can't specifically name who, but I think I remember seeing a comment from a prequel trilogy hater saying that they felt the Geonosians were like a racist metaphor for Russians during the Cold War. Oh, God. Are we, so going back to the freaking Nemodians being racist argument again? God damn it. No, no, no wait, not the Nemodians, the Geonosians. Well, uh, what I'm saying is that I'm seeing a similar pattern here. That's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Wait till you tell these people that the Rebel Alliance was based on the Viet Cong. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, man, these people are idiots. And so. also the Ewoks. Yes, the original trilogy was essentially just one big reference to Vietnam. Though, of course, they wouldn't know that. Yeah, they think it's more based off the American Revolution. I mean, it, 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 it baffles my mind that, like, oh, God. It's like, how? How do you come to these conclusions? Drunk as fuck. <laughs> and nowadays, the uh, Empire are the good guys. Uh... Because why not? But that's a totally the different conversation. The Empire is supposed to be the Americans uh, during... Yeah. Mm. During the Vietnam War. And you that's can, you can make his argument, own you can admission, make the too. Based on America or based off the Roman Empire. Or the Nazis, but... Nazis, yeah. yeah. It's all of them. Mm -hmm. Just a combination. So, there's that. But that's Blanket for you. Then he claims that Anakin and Padme being on Naboo are not really safe as anyone could go to Naboo and just kill her easily. Uh, can the Queen... I mean, the Queen has... I mean, can any official from Naboo prevent anyone just from landing there? Mmm, pretty sure, yeah. Or, I mean, didn't Padme say something like she knows Naboo well because she is a native of the planet? Well, that was more okay, Padme herself uh, saying native, that. But... Yeah, you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she knows the plan well, so that's so she knows where she could hide, uh, and not to mention Mace Windu told uh, Anakin to use a more public transport and travel with refugees to make sure they don't see that Padme left the capital. Yeah. So there's that too. Then Plinket does this really weird like love test for Anakin in in which he's like uh, asking this porn star to like judge Anakin and see if he's the appropriate man for a woman to date like for like judging not only his looks but also how he speaks 
acts and everything. And if, and if Anakin is either being awkward or whiny or a- anything that pretty much goes against a uh, regular uh, real life, uh, what a real life couple would do, he like puts big excess on them. And the only good uh, check mark that I saw he gave was Anakin's looks, that he's handsome. Like, I mean, I believe I believe Geekdom 101 did something similar to that along with Sai Kwame when they were talking to uh, some girl during the hype around The Force Awakens and comparing it to the prequels. They uh, asked a girl after hearing Anakin talk about killing the Tusken Raiders, uh, would, they st- would they try to feel pity and still try to be in a relationship with him? And the girl said, no, this guy sounds like a psychopath. I'm going to leave as soon as possible. Which is the same kind of commentary that uh, How It Should Have Ended did that. Well, at least now we know where How It Should Have Ended got it from. So, there is that there. Uh, yeah, so it's, it was a weird love test uh, that he did. And then, Plinkett seems to have like a really strong really big incel mentality in this review because more so in the phantom menace because he brings a lot of sexual innuendos and jokes about it and brings a porn star to give him advice how to treat women and date them yeah that actually is in this review like a lot of that (laughs) what Mm -hmm. and then blinket claims that Padme serves to be fucked because of her using sexy outfits to seduce anakin (laughs) yeah he actually was thinking about sex Mm-hmm. Then Plinkett completely misunderstands why Anakin killed the Tusken Raiders and brought Shmi's body to the Lars homestead. Like, he actually was questioning why the fuck was Anakin bringing the corpse to the homestead and why did he kill the Tusken Raiders? He completely did not understand what was going on. He was oblivious to it. Like, deliberately oblivious to that. Yeah, seems like it. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then he claims that Darth Maul is homosexual because he actually gave no reason. He just said it was homosexual. <laughs> Wait, was there a scene? Oh, uh, this must have seen where Maul, I mean, Plinky called Darth Maul gay for some reason. Yeah, he called him. Yeah, it's in this one. He called him a, a gay <laughs> or homosexual. I, it was one of those two. But maybe why? that's maybe that's where Mauler got that reference from when he did the sequel trilogy reviews. Mm-hmm. I don't really understand why he said that, but whatever. Um, then he then he claims that that Mace Windu was horribly miscast. That Samuel Jackson is better at portraying over the top motherfuckers. That basically Mace Windu should be played by somebody else, not Samuel Jackson. That's what he's saying. I've seen Samuel uh, Jackson play people who are very down to earth and straight faced. And also people who are over the top and very confrontational. He's he has he can he has range. So he's not just a one new actor. So that's a little okay. crap. So how many pulp fiction type of movies do you think Samuel Jackson can appear? Mm, so a few, but I don't think forever. I watched a couple of Samuel Jackson movies where he is the rage induced guy or kind of noisy than the, the prequel trilogy. Examples will be Die Hard with a Vengeance. Anyone saw that movie? Mm, haven't seen it yet, no. Oh, that's great. Another example would be, what is it? Pulp Fiction. And another example would be, this is not a movie, but Boondocks. He plays a character called Jin Rummy. Hmm. And also, depending on the writers, I mean, he's kind of like that in the MCU when he's playing Nick Fury sometimes. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Indeed. So there's that. And then continuing with the Sam- with Samuel Jackson. Okay, get ready because I think this one is going to piss off a few of you. Plinkett claims that Samuel Jackson is in this movie because George Lucas wanted a black guy in the Jedi Council since Star Wars is not liked that much by black people. That sounds, that sounds, fuck? That sounds more like something Kathleen Kennedy would do. Well, apparently Plinkett claims that George Lucas thought that not many black people like Star Wars, so let's put Samuel Jackson here. Oh, I mean, I guess Plinkett forgot about Lando Carizian. That Carlisi. Yeah, yeah, you know, the fact that he thinks that people can't relate to other people unless there's black, like they're, they're the same ethnicity or the same sex, 
sex or the sex sexual orientation or whatever. That kind of makes Plinkin seem kind of racist or he whatever. Is, he is a racist. It's he just is. that this comment only shows it even more. <laughs> Which I think I I joke even if it's for a joke or not. I'm sorry, but that is very racist. I don't think I really don't think even as a joke. I don't think that should have been done. Honestly. I think the more more the the kind of things Plinkin didn't literally said it, but he was saying using visuals like gangster movies with black guys on it. So it seems like Plinkett thinks like black people in general only like movies where thugs appear. My God, how limited in terms of op in terms of being open minded and seeing people portray multiple roles or whatever type of role. My God. So yeah, sorry if a few of you got uh, insulted by that, that Plinkett said, but that's what he said in that review. And it's one that, well, pissed me off a while ago when I first heard of it, and it still pisses me off. Even Ninkara pulled this out in his review. Well, I guess that's one positive we can call him that. <laughs> so, but yeah, seriously, like, screw you, Plinkett, for that one. Seriously, that, is, that shit's offensive. What's next? Well, Plinkett claims that George Lucas ruined the lightsaber because there's too much of it on screen. Yeah, that same criticism. I don't think we need to tackle it again. But he went with this criticism again. Uh, you know, no surprise. And he also went with the Yoda shouldn't use a lightsaber argument. Of course. Why not? Well, at least now we know the origins of, from where a lot of people had those criticisms. aka from this guy. So, there's that. Most of these YouTube reviewers or commentators on the prequel trilogy aren't original. They repeat the same arguments said by Plinkett. Plinkett. Yep, exactly. And there's some of them have even made that evident, like Stockman. So there's that. You're the real NPCs, OT fanboys. You're the real Cos NPCs. Cosmona Variety is also an example because he repeats the same argument used by Plinkett. Well, mm. to a point, it's actually really cringeworthy. <laughs> yep, indeed. Then, oh, and of course, Plinkett claimed that Attack of the Clones ripped off Empire Strikes Back a lot. Like having, like Luke Skywalker having a robotic hand, the female main character yeah. wearing white, and of course, both movies having an asteroid chase sequence. <laughs> Uh, so, oh. so the same criticism of the asteroid chase, except that now he's saying that both movies are a uh, rip off and, each other wait, entirely. And let me ask, how is it actually ripping it up if he actually came up with the story? That's not ripping it up, is it? Even let's assume that Attack of the Clones is a carbon copy of Empire Strikes Back. It's not still ripping it up because how can you rip up something you created? <laughs> Uh, no idea, but he, yeah, he claims that Attack of the Clones rips off Empire Strikes Back a lot. <sighs> yeah, it's stupid. Then he claims that there's no tension whatsoever in the movie. Well, I mean, of course he would say that. He doesn't understand what the hell's going on. <laughs> no wonder this bastard is a failed filmmaker. <laughs> yeah. Then he claims that the Corson speeder chase scene breaks the rules of reality because there's a Jedi jumping from high altitudes and survives. His argument breaks the rules of logic. <laughs> uh, indeed, no one, but... Well, that's blanket for you. <laughs> Again, I would just bring up the fact that the original trilogy didn't always adhere to logic. I mean, look at the Falcon. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Like, what the the Falcon's design makes absolutely no sense when you when you look at the, its interior and compare it to its exterior. Mm. But you don't hear any of these people complain about that. Oh, don't forget. Also, people don't really complain about uh, having the Emperor suddenly throwing force lightning at somebody else, or the fact that we're in space. Or that there is a, a humongous super weapon that can destroy planets. Or the fact that you could actually hear laser blast sounds in space. How do you hear noise in space? 
No idea, but there you go. That's plain, that's blanket for you. <laughs> I I can't believe that he actually that he cl that he claims that one scene breaks the rules of reality, but yet the original trilogy has plenty of things that don't make no sense in real life. But <sighs> there you go. And then Blinket, for some reason, he just really, really hates seeing children in Star Wars movies. Like, he really hates it. Like, he hates seeing a lot of kids on screen. In particular, the part in the Jedi Temple where Yoda is training young legs. Like, he just hates seeing children. Like, he really hates them. Ah, okay. No, really, he really hates them. Like, I don't... He, like, he, he made a rant about them for, like, for like a few minutes. Like, it, uh, it, it was insane. And maybe he does like the scene from Order 66 then. <laughs> Possibly. Uh, we'll, we'll see that when, I, when we get to that video. And then he claims that Obi-Wan telling Anakin to go to the left to strike a Dooku makes no sense. Yeah, he actually said that. <laughs> uh, it's almost as if he doesn't understand the character or something. <laughs> yep, indeed. <laughs> What does he actually understand anyway? No idea. But, but yeah, that's the that's the Plinket review. <laughs> so, got any? Th uh, there are a few things I mi I missed out, but that's because the next portion of the of this podcast we're gonna deal with them. So, but yes, that's the Plinket review. So, what do you guys think of that? <laughs> Incoherent pile of garbage. <laughs> He's an idiot. Uh, the Django got something to say on that. <laughs> yeah, that pretty much mentioned everything. Uh, it's it's just Neeson. nonsensical garbage. Liam Neeson said this once. The ability to speak does not make you intelligent. <laughs> yeah, but for some reason, so many people claim this review is the ultimate analysis of Attack of the Clones. Like the ultimate. Ultimate pile of garbage. <laughs> yeah, that I agree with. <laughs> yep. Okay, so now we get into the elephant of the room. Yes, you know it, guys. The romance what? between Anakin and Padme. Yep, you can't go... You can't talk about Attack of the Clones in a review or podcast without mentioning the elephant in the room itself. Oh, do we have to explain I hate sand? We'll get into it, though, one. Yes, we'll get into it. Anyway, so... Okay. So, the first thing they say is that the Jedi aren't allowed to love and have a romantic relationship, and yet the Jedi Council allows Anakin to go with Padme in one of the most romantic places ever. So much for the Jedi can't love rule and making sure to not encourage Jedi to fall in love. <laughs> Okay, the only thing I would kind of suspect something is why wouldn't wasn't Padme under the protection of a female Jedi, but other than that, I mean, just because there's a male and a female on some trip doesn't mean there's ultimately gonna be some kind of romance. That's some leaps of logic. Yeah, and like, uh, the Jedi are, they have expectations with every Jedi member that they're gonna follow the tenets, and there is expectations with every single Jedi out there. They're not going to expect, like, oh, you're gonna fall in love with this person, and you're gonna fall in love with that. No, they're gonna expect that you're gonna be at your best always. So, just nonsense. Mm hmm Oh, and can I also mention that didn't we see at the beginning of this movie that, that Padme was not really inclined of having any type of Jedi protect her, but the only reason she accepted in the end is because Palpatine suggested that maybe an old friend protecting her would probably be a better idea, like Master Kenobi, you know, like how he's like how he said at the beginning. So that's that's probably the reason why it had to be either Obi-Wan or Anakin protecting her in the entire movie. So that there's that. Then the next criticism of, for the romance is that there's no chemistry whatsoever between Anakin and Padme's relationship. Like, none. Well, that's their opinion. That's not what I see. I, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I see two people who knew each other when they were a lot younger. Ten years ago. And when they're around each other, or they're more comfortable to speak about how they really feel around each other compared to other people. They understand each other, where each other is coming from. I'd say, yeah, there is chemistry there. <laughs> yeah. 
And then the same people claim that the romance <laughs> is too stale, forced, and awkward with a lot of cringe-worthy dialogue in it. Okay, the cringe-worthy dialogue could be explained. Okay, Anakin has been in a temple full of monks who reject the concept of attachment, romance, or whatever. How would Anakin know how to properly have a romantic dialogue when he's separated from all those things for 10 years? Mm -hmm. Also, it doesn't help that the Jedi will know jack shit in terms of how to deal with romantic emotions or feelings for, for a certain other. You think other. Jedi are some dating coaches? <laughs> no, if, even if they were, they, they would suck at it. Yeah. So... Like, like that's the point. I like, like, okay. So, I mean, that, I mean, that's, I mean, that's entirely Christ. These, these people. And, and following up on that, then, then some people claim that the romance in the Tactic Clones is considered unrelatable because no real life couple or two people attracted to each other will talk or act like how Anakin and Padme do in Attack of the Clones. Okay. So. Okay, let me just start off with teenagers. Teenagers are weird and dumb and don't know how to approach situations like these. And for Anakin, in a situation like this, he's seeing someone he's looked up to for a while, and now he sees her after 10 years, he doesn't know what to say and kind of says like these awkward stuff. So this is something that every person has done. Like, I don't think there has been someone who has been perfect and knows how to approach a woman or approach a man and say, like, these quirky lines or know how to entice them right away. It takes a while just to get to that point and be confident enough to say to that point. So to be perfect and to know what to say and know how to approach these situations is nonsense, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Can I mention that I actually went through that in my childhood and teenagehood? I first, I was not an expert on that. Took years to actually get it. It took me like 26 years to actually approach a woman and to actually talk to them. So like <laughs> the idea that like, like right away, right off the bat, oh, I know how to talk to chicks and all this other stuff. Like get out of here. <laughs> so yeah, this type of, this type of romance that we've seen in Attack the Clones actually can happen in real life. It's not impossible to see it in real life as some claim i mean they could have a ro romantic feelings developed over uh, such uh, dangerous incidents for example if you see the first terminator the kyle reese and sarah connor don't really have much chemistry with each other the only relationship they have is i was trying to protect her sarah is trying to survive against the terminator and they somehow fell in love with each other there's that yeah uh, however, Anakin and Padme have the the benefit of basically already knowing each other because of, of what happened in episode one. So at least they had a bigger leg up uh, in, re in regards to actually feeling something for each other. So there's that. And continuing with the, oh, it's unrelatable uh, because no real life couple will do that. A lot of people, they claim that the romance between Han and Leia was done better because it was more natural, more real. And the dialogue was fast, humorous, and witty. And that it also kept up the pace of the surrounding scenes and just fit in. Whereas in Attack the Clones, the romance is slow, with no excitement, no cleverness, and no surrounding tension, which ends up being boring. <laughs> It's Anna almost Leia. as if the context is completely different and the story of the romance is completely different and is going for something different. <laughs> if you actually analyze the romance between Han and Leia, it boils down to, I hate you, I also hate you, I hate you, I kind of think I like you, yeah, I hate you, I know, I love, what, what the f- <laughs> It's basically sexual tension- that slowly builds up into an actual legitimate relationship. Mm -hmm. Han and Leia's relationship is uninteresting. It only gets interesting in, well, the EU. In the films themselves, There's, I'm not at all invested in them getting together. <laughs> the only reason for me, I think, uh, Han and Leia develop romance in Empire Strikes Back is they're the only two humans with each other, and Luke is in a different location. <laughs> I mean, you could, I mean, you could say that, yeah. <laughs> so, 
there is that. <laughs> So yeah. Oh, but oh, by the way, the the guy that pretty much said that about Han and Leia was Hello Greedo. But no surprise that he's not the only one that like Han and Leia's romance more than Anakin and Padme's. So <laughs> Hello Greedo, a lucky fanboy. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. Oh, and then of course one of the big parts is the romance. Ah, uh, you know it. I hate sand. It's so rough and coarse and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Yeah, the sand line, it gets mocked a lot because of how cringe it is. So much so that many consider it the worst line of dialogue in Star Wars history. Yeah, I'm not kidding on that. Is that, is that, is that even that big of a deal? <laughs> oh, you want to hear about a really cringeworthy romantic line? It's not about killing <laughs> the things we hate. It's about saving <laughs> the things we love. Oh, God. Oh, okay, Dolan, here's how it goes. <clears throat> Oh yeah, from one of our favorite Star Wars movies. <laughs> so, I saved you, dummy. It's not about destroying the things we hate, but saving what we love. Kiss me, Finn. Mm. <laughs> That's do what we, it do is. We, do, we got any cringe, do we got any cringe lines for fucking Raylo? Uh, well, well, besides the fact of that... Of course, is already cringeworthy enough. Yeah, but... Okay, here's the thing about this line. Yes, compared to other lines, I mean, I, I think it's wrong to compare this to other lines. I'd say we should just talk about it on its own, because on its own, it's... it's I Of course, the word cringe is overused as all hell. Every, anyone who uses it is should be slapped, because it's such Every an single, overused fucking word. Every single potator. Yes. And but here's the thing, though. Why does he say that line? Padme just said she liked going, or she liked the beach. <laughs> and Anakin says, I don't like sand. And of course, it should be fucking obvious as to why. Tatooine. He hates Tatooine. And then he I... says, not like here, though. That is to say, he hated Tatooine, but he likes it on Naboo. Because it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. The thing with the prequel dialogue, this it doesn't go for all the dialogue, but it's it should be utilized, especially with episode two and the romance stuff is because Lucas is going for more of a Shakespeare feel to the romance. You shouldn't take the dialogue at face value. There is a deeper meaning to the dialogue. It's not even that deep. Maybe like three inches, maybe even a foot. It's not that deep. It should be so fucking obvious to figure out what exactly he means. Mm -hmm. And it's not even that quote unquote cringy uh, because it makes sense for him to say that. It also is far from the worst line of dialogue in Star Wars history, but yet so many people claim it is, even though they're still one in The Last Jedi. Well, keep in mind, The Last Jedi came out over, well, almost two decades after, so it's wrong to... It, we really shouldn't bring up that movie, because when Plinkett was... When these videos were coming out, that movie wasn't even in production yet. Well, that's true. But even after it came out, they still consider the sand line the worst line of dialogue. I've seen it. It's true. I mean, yes, in that regard, we should bring it up, but I mean... Remember, Henson, PT haters, whenever they bring Chris to the prequels, they never bring it to the sequels. Even if the sequels do it worse. They always yes, do it. Yes, I know. I'm just saying when, in regards to this, we got to keep in mind when these reviews were made. Like, the Plinkett reviews weren't made when The Last Jedi was out. So we can't take that and put it on that. Modern, when Plinkett talks... Mo in, if Plinkett talks about it nowadays, then yes, it's worth bringing up. But in terms of reviews that were made back then, there's no point. It's like they say, it's not how the word itself. It's where it's used in its proper context. Yeah. So, there is a, also, oh, and one thing regarding the 
basically when when you said Henson that the romance is the dialogue is Shakespeare like inspired by Shakespeare it's interesting that you mentioned that because George Lucas and one of the producers in the documentary the behind the scenes they said that Romeo and Juliet was one of the inspirations for this movie also uh, keep in mind that Lucas is very heavily inspired by old cinema and if you watch older and if you watch films from like the mostly the talkies you know like 30s 40s and 50s this is essentially how people talked like it was very on the nose and not a lot of subtlety it's like context and in this is why people should do research because understanding that Lucas was inspired by, you know, Romeo and Juliet or romance films or films with more romantic element. Point is, he had inspirations. Keep that in mind because Star Wars is always influenced by at least one fucking thing. Exactly. But again, prequel haters don't make <laughs> research. Oh, I want to add something too about the romance. What is it? So something that people the prequel uh, haters don't mention at all is that the soundtracks for the prequels are fucking awesome. They are incredible and super memorable. Um, it's not just one song, Duel of Fates from episode one. There is a variety of great music used throughout the films. Mm -hmm. And with the romance, I feel like the music actually helps to enhance the romance. And I don't mind it at all. Uh, with the field section, for instance, you have the flute playing in the background. It feels very soothing, and it helps to enhance the romantic uh, feeling of them talking and bonding with one another. So that's just how I feel. I don't know how you guys feel, but I feel like the music was just really great for the uh, romance, uh, romantic moments for them. The entire movie has great music. Actually, prequel haters don't really criticize the soundtracks of the prequels that much. They, it's actually one of those elements that they actually do praise. So. Love Across the Stars is one of the soundtrack which mm -hmm. It's really interesting because it has some kind of a sad tone. The music, John Williams portrays it really well. I mean, shows that this meh this romance is eventually not going to end well. Mm hmm Yeah, that's a true. romance destined to fail. Mm hmm Yep. Mm. So indeed. Anyway, final things to mention on the romance. No. No? Okay. Well, now we're going to the into the final part of this podcast for the conclusion. The what did this movie do in terms of the impact on the expanded universe and the boys there are plenty to talk about okay let's uh, talk about the number one thing before any of this which is jester maria actually uh a bit before that the one no the number one thing that this movie influenced by the universe the clone wars multimedia project that is the number one yeah, thing that this movie I, did the clone wars multimedia project it's more revenge the fit for me. Actually, actually, keep in mind, Attack the Clones, the one that gave the green light, especially the first half, 2002, 2003. So... The first Clone Wars. Let's see. Yeah, so, let's see. Oh, no, no. One thing I gotta mention. Uh, yeah, the Phantom Menace novelization. Mm -hmm. uh, why is Phantom Menace novelization important? Mm -hmm. Ensign in general might know the scene where Anakin actually saves a Tusken Raider mm -hmm. from a crushed yep. rock stone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This later is ironic because Anakin saves a Tusken Raider, which is revealed to be the Tusken Raiders revealed to be the same tribesman which killed his mother. Huh. Like, what kind of irony is that? Oh boy. That's. So <laughs> well, that's something. <laughs> So, there you go. I guess that's one action I can regret in the end. <laughs> so, yep, definitely the episode two novelization uh, is one that we've got to mention in terms of the impact on the EU. So there was there's a couple of other novels too. There's Approaching Storm, and there was a couple of others that were prequels to episode two as well. Mm -hmm. Cloak yeah. of Deception. Cloak of Deception. Yeah, because apparently it has several elements from the episode two script, like the like the Techno Union, for example. I would also mention Rogue Planet, because Rogue yeah. Planet is one of the first sources 
that actually mentions battle droids not being controlled by a command center and have more free will. Mm, I guess. Uh, don't know why that would be related to episode 2, but okay. Uh, because, you know, you see that the battle droids are not controlled by a command center. They have more free will. Go on seeing something like, my legs are moving, I must require maintenance. Uh. Or one of the droids punching the other battle droids because they're not moving fast enough. Oh uh, yeah, super battle droid punching the, the B1 battle droid, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Mm -hmm. but obviously the but obviously the big the biggest impact this pan universe had that episode two did is obviously the beginning of the clone wars multimedia project first two years in particular because the entire clone wars finally we got the beginning of the clone wars and we're actually seeing it from not only from the clone wars 2002 video game to the issues of star wars republic all the way from 49 up until 67 before they started using episode 3 elements to then the, Cl the clone wars micro series in the first volume to like then galactic battlegrounds clone campaigns to like star star wars bounty hunter the video game like so many things like this is the cl the Clone Wars. Like this was something that was mentioned all the way back in episode four, and finally we're seeing it in its full potential in the expanded universe. Like this finally, is not, this is not much of a E reference, but if you actually go to the uh, course and bar, you actually see a screen of Episode One Racer for some reason. Uh, it's it's more of an Easter egg. It's not really a uh, reference. Well, I mean, here's the thing, though. <laughs> Given the fact that pod racing is so popular, obviously in a bar, you would see, you know, a pod race. And instead of just animating a pod racing sequence, just rip footage from the, you know, pod racer game and bada bing, bada boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is that. Of course, uh, if we're talking about the multimedia project, there's a multi. There's all of the novels, uh, particular the first one, Shadow Points as Deception, uh, so on and so forth. And then of course, Rep the Republic Commando. Like there, there's um, ba the first Battlefront game that pr that had all the Phase One uh, clones. In fact, uh, as you've seen in this video, there's been footage of Battlefront One portraying the Clone Wars. So there's that too. Well, what about the countless the a lot of Django Fett tying comics. Yeah, Django Fett open seasons. That's another thing that this movie definitely helped. In, in fact, okay, now we get into what you want. What you wanted to talk about, that one. Uh, that apparently, so okay, a lot of good things this movie did in terms of the impact on the U. But there are some things that some people weren't particularly fond of. And well, let's get into them. So the first one we'll tackle is that Boa Fett's origin from the EU was contradicting, particular what Dark Empire 2 said, that Boba Fett was originally a stormtrooper and not a clone, as episode 2 told us. Actually, this plot point is addressed in the last one standing, the tale of Boba Fett, mm -hmm. where Boba Fett actually decides to become a stormtrooper after leaving Concord Dawn. Mm -hmm. There's that. So, but so, but then don't. So for that's not even a contradiction. Yeah, that but, was already solved in the nineties. Yeah, but then don't forget that, that something building up to that was the fact that some even speculated that Jaster Maria was Boa Fett's real name and not Boa Fett. But of course, Django Fett Open Seasons pretty much addresses that immediately. Yeah, seriously, stop talking about Jaster Maria. It will make EU fans go nuts. <laughs> like, this is the same argument EU haters use constantly to say how inconsistent the EU was. Jasper Mario, Jasper Mario. Like, shut up. No one cares. <laughs> There's that. The jungle, what do you got to say regarding Boa Fett's origins supposedly be contradicted by episode two? Yeah, I mean, it's a little. I mean, like the one said, it's like, it's been fixed, so it's not a big issue at all. It's just finding, they're just trying to find a little things here and there just to find wrongs with the EU, but it's it's whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and one of the most annoying things I've also heard is like, people wanted the version of the Clone Wars that was written in the Throne Trilogy? Yeah, about so... 
Yeah, so apparently there's there's some <coughs> EU fans from the 90s that they either had their own version of how the Clone Wars would go or they imagined it in some way because of what they read from the Tron trilogy. <coughs> They're apparently... Okay, what was what was said in the Tron trilogy, though, one, that how were the Clone Wars? It was like they were fighting against clone masters in a clone rebellion. <laughs> some weird stuff there. <laughs> Which, Which I'm actually glad that George Lucas didn't use this plot point. <laughs> Though ironically, this did surface as an idea for a few EU stories, if you mention, because the Empire fought, fought against the Clone Rebellion and Camino in Star Wars Battlefront 2, if you remember, in the campaign. And Siege of Salukami, which yeah. is even mentioned in Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm, that too, so, so yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting one. Then, the next is EU contradiction caused by Attack of the Clones, according to these people, that the age of the Galactic Republic, because in episode 4, it was said to be a thousand generations, like at least more than a thousand years. But episode 2 says it was a thousand years. So... Anyone who read the Darth Bane trilogy <laughs> knows this. Anson, would you mind explaining rules on the Reformation? Or should anyone else? So essentially, we had this group of Sith called the Brotherhood of Darkness who raged, who raged war against the Republic. And the final battle took place... Was the planet called Rusan or is that just the location on the planet? It is called Rusan. Yeah, so, they, so the last battle was on a planet called Rusan. And without getting without getting into specifics, essentially shit happened that led to the destruction of of the entire Brotherhood of Darkness. And the only survivors were Bane and Zana, who would later become his apprentice. And with the Brotherhood of Darkness now dead, the Republic created the um, Rusan Reformation, which essentially kickstarted what the Republic would become by the time we get to the prequels. Mm -hmm. so, it starts a new era, essentially, for the Republic. Mm -hmm, exactly. So, so the expanded universe pretty much fixed this one. Now, there is one... Well, gotta... I mean, no, no. Here's the thing, though. Because you could gather that by the film. Palpatine says, I will not let this Republic, which has stood for a thousand years... Okay, that... He, you could easily gather that he's just referring to this specific era of the Republic. Because when you have Obi-Wan say, for over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights of the Garden is a piece of just of the old Republic. Meaning, he's referring to all eras of the Republic when he says that. Mm -hmm. So you so all the Darth Bane trilogy did was just give added detail on that. Because you could kinda... easily gather that, oh, Palpatine is just referring to this specific era of the Republic. It it's kinda... called using your fucking brain, people. It's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of makes me wonder about certain things. Whether there was, like, a bigger story going around. Because in the Darth Bane novel, and now Phantom Menace novelization, there's Darth Bane mission, and there's also Darth Ruin mission. And in the movies, there's, like, the Sith has been extinct. For a millennium, a millennium, right? a millennium, but also in episode two, uh, there hasn't been a full scale war since the formation of the Republic. And I will not let this Republic that's due for a thousand years. So it makes me wonder if George Lucas has some kind of a bigger storyline planning out and he just gave up while writing it. I mean, keep in mind, Lucas was the type of guy, I mean, we saw this with Darth Bane. He created this backstory, which wasn't used in the films, but I'm, but I'm very sure, just like what happened with Darth Bane, he gave that information to EU authors to use. Mm -hmm. The novelization of Episode One. So there's that. Okay, so so there's that uh, for the Age of the Galactic Republic. Now we get into the other big EU contradiction, which which is actually the one that has popped up a lot regards to Tactic Clones and its impact on the EU, that 
But apparently, the Jedi aren't allowed to love and marry rule. Apparently, contradicts how certain Jedi in the in the either the original trilogy era or post original trilogy era that are marrying and having kids. You know, like Luke and Mara Jade having kids, as well as other Jedi like like Jason if and Jaina Solo. If you look at the EU in the 1990s during the New Republic era mm -hmm. and the Tales of the Jedi, Jedi are actually allowed to allowed to be married and have have loved ones romance each other but now one thing you have to notice is luke's jedi order is not the same jedi order from the prequel trilogy mm. that already is not a valid argument That's and even if we didn't count that who's exactly is going to enforce these rules who's left of the old jedi order to do that <laughs> the only Granted, one that there were order 66 survivors but not many the only Jedi that I can think of that actually kind of was a defined look for that was Bergeri in the New Jedi Order because she actually was like a question look you you have a wife you have children they might be your downfall or something like or something like that like because Bergeri cling to the old ways of the of the Jedi Order you know the ones from the prequel trilogy but no. Luke just ignored and said they're my family I if I didn't have Mara or Ben I wouldn't be where I am here now. Now, at some point in the Old Republic era, between Tales of the Jedi and the Knights of the Old Republic video game, sometime, uh, Jedi being able to be in love with each other or having a partner was banned. Mm -hmm. Because of uh, full cow drama and what happened, yeah. Yeah, so makes me assume, was Knights of the Old Republic, you know, Bastilan, Revan, being not being is that influenced by Rev Anakin and Padme? Like, um, no, I think no, I think it, I think it was more their their own thing. However, it is pos it is possible that that George Lucas probably because you know Episode Two, like the Jedi, the rule of Jedi aren't allowed to love and marry. Pro Bioware probably thought they probably should put that in in their own game. Uh, but con but considering that considering that the that the events of Tales of the Jedi ga gave a very good reason for that rule existing at that time in Kotor, uh, there there doesn't seem to have been much of a problem. Basically, uh, I guess George Lucas and the and the creators for the EU content at least they had communication on how to do that and make sure it's not a mess. <laughs> More contradictions. Well, those are the those are the main ones that I can think of. Unless you got some others that were started by episode two. Ah. So if not, then then let's then let's just mention some other things that episode two influenced in the expanded universe. Uh, that was the Star Wars bounty hunter game. Yeah, that was I did. great. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jedi Starfighter, the video game that actually came out before. That actually was the first appearance of several of several episode two elements, including the Jedi Starfighter, <laughs> Django Fed, the Slave One, the clones, and the <laughs> Black Gunship. Like that game actually came. That game actually had like it's like a sneak peek to episode two attack, yeah. attack the clones. <laughs> this Which... is clear evidence that the EU had George Lucas gave information to the, e the EU creators. And to suggest that George Lucas was not involved in any way is lunacy. Because how would these video game developers get these sneak peek information about episode 2 if George Lucas wasn't involved in, it, in some kind of way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, any other mentions that episode 2 uh, influenced the Spanish universe? Besides uh, the, the entire new essential world. guide to characters, um, I guess I guess we could say the es the essential guides uh, in some way. Um, though I think I think it would be best that we save that for episode three itself, because that because that's where the the entire uh, time timeline is complete. But but yeah, you could yeah. say in some ways those were influenced a bit. <laughs> so, oh yeah. By the way, do you know what's the cringe worthy? Not cringe. The weird thing about uh. <clears throat> The new essential guide to uh, guide to characters. Mm, what about it? It's it lists Palpatine and Sidious as two different characters while referring Palpatine as the Emperor. Hmm, well, so, I I think that so, was 
it either was a typo or they tried to do the <laughs> Palpatine series are different, but I guess in the end they realized it, that doing that in that guy probably was not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's just a typo. Anyway, so if there's not much that we need to discuss to discuss if Episode Two's influence in the EU, then shall we now get into the conclusion, guys? Yes. Okay. Well, now we get to the conclusion. So, uh, so who goes first in the conclusion? Uh, I'll go. Okay. So yeah, quite frankly, I've never under. I mean, I don't understand the hate for any of these movies, but especially this one, I I don't understand why. <laughs> it's regarded as the worst and as we've established here most of the criticisms no shock are invalid episode two is fantastic i think it is better than episode one and it did so much for the franchise i quite frankly i'm glad it was made okay anything else no okay next I, I can go next. Okay. So, I I I love this movie. I and I honestly think this is like my favorite of the prequel trilogy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they it, it did this movie did a lot of things. Um, you know the slow turn of Anakin going down the dark side, uh, the bond with Anakin and Obi Wan, and the battle scene was just amazing. I. I've never seen anything like it, and I still think to this day, like, the battle in Geonosis is, like, still one of the best-looking battles to see um, in a movie, like, ever. And, uh, yeah, it's just, this was the start of great things to come for the Clone Wars and, you know, within the EU and stuff, but, um, yeah, it's, it's still, like, a legendary, well, not legend, well, a great movie to this day, and I, I still look, uh, look forward to watching it always. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else? No. Okay. Next. I'll go next. Uh, most of the criticisms we have doubted don't really make sense because if you use your brain more than 10 seconds, you realize how ignored that sound. But, you know, like I said with the episode one, people need to defend these movies because the current narrative is that these movies are bad and yeah it's just sad that these people are repeating these movies now i appreciate what these this movie has done to the franchise because clone wars and its related media has spawned like a two separate television shows multiple video games toys books and comics so yeah you can see this is one of the most impactful Star Wars movies, other than the original trilogy, I guess. Mm hmm Okay. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> and I can see that this movie is interesting in an aspect that there are no clear good guy or bad guy, which is something interesting, interesting aspect George Lucas actually pulled, because neither the Republic nor the Separatists are good. But we can't exactly call them bad, so yeah, uh, putting a morally gray situation is I can appreciate that. Yeah, I'm done. Hmm. Okay, uh, King. Oh, well, after watching this movie today and picking everything that people have said about it, I honestly don't think this criticism holds up. In fact, uh, this movie was actually better than I remember. I mean, I've, I think I said that. That Attack of the Clones was my least favorite of the prequel trilogy, despite the fact that I like the trilogy as a whole and don't think like, Attack of the Clones is bad. But I may have to change my re my review where I said it's my least favorite to say that it's actually not that bad. I mean, I like it better than I uh, than I uh, originally thought I did. Okay. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Now for me, well. I really think Attack of the Clones deserves so much undeserved hate. Like, the worst Star Wars movie? Not even close. Seriously, please. There's far worse movies. You know which ones I'm talking about. Uh, there are sequels! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, seriously, Attack of the Clones, far from the worst. Like, it has a lot more good in it than it is given credit for. And I really think that they... 
Uh, you guys should really give it a, give it another chance. Don't use the biased prequel hating nonsense that a lot of people have been putting across the internet and many other circles since 2008, 2009. Like, actually watch it, actually judge it for yourself, and act and also do a bit of research as to why the movie was made as it was made. Instead, instead of coming with your ideas that maybe George Lucas was delusional or in what he was doing or he didn't know what he was doing, like, no, no, no. Actually, actually research and actually see what, what the mode is behind it and everything. Like, actually give this movie more credit because really, it is not a bad movie. In fact, I'd say it's a, I'd say it's a good Star Wars movie. It, it is... All six, all six Star Wars movies made by George Lucas, like episodes one to six, all of them, I like them. My least favorite, well, I don't know, because he's usually drawn between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, but that's mostly, be but that's mostly because, uh, but that's mostly because uh, I like all six Star Wars movies almost equally, so it's hard for me to choose which one I least like. I know the, I know the one I like the most, episode three, and I'll explain the next video why, but. But in regards to Attack of the Clones, I really, I really think this this movie definitely is is a it's a good movie. It deserves a lot more, a lot more respect, a lot more, a lot more credit for what it did. Seriously, please give it an, give it another shot. Don't listen to the prequel haters and just do it. And with that, well, we finish this podcast. We'll see you guys on the next prequel defense podcast which is revenge of the sith that was going to be a fun one so stay tuned for yeah. that now that's that's definitely going to take a while because these podcasts definitely are some of the biggest undertakings we've done but don't worry it will be worth it guys so with that we'll see you guys in the next state of star wars video bye bye, bye. see you guys see ya. farewell mortals <laughs>